And we will move on to our 6.10 item, 130 p.m. A, informational presentations by Big Valley Band of Pomo Indians, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, California Fish and Game Commission, Chai Council for Clear Lake Hitch, Lake County Agricultural Advisory Committee, Lake County Water Resources Department, Robinson Rancheria and State Water Resources Control Board pertaining to the current status of the Clear Lake Hitch or CHI and B, consideration of the draft proclamation declaring a Clear Lake Hitch emergency. This is brought by Supervisors Green and Crandall. And I, I just wanna take a moment and recognize that this is such a, um, this is a big moment to finally have this public forum and to have all the stakeholders present in this room and on Zoom and be able to um, listen to each other and learn from each other. We have tribal nations, we have councils, we have committees, we have boards. For a lot of people here contributing to the conversation, I don't think it's happened before and I think that this is um, kind of a, a, a moment that we can all recognize as being really important and I will turn it over to Supervisor Green for a comment, yeah. get us started. Intro, uh, thank you all for coming. I, I, I agree, this is a significant moment. Uh, back in December, there was another dis uh, uh, significant moment uh, uh, where there, an intergovernmental summit was held on the current status of the Clue Lake Hitch. And um, uh, it was so significant in that it successfully brought together a lot of our uh, partner agencies, uh, state and federal agencies, uh, and our uh, Native sovereign nations uh, to bring forward um, important information. We've been talking about the hitch for years, but certainly uh, events in recent years have highlighted just the significance of this decline. And it does create challenges uh, for everyone involved in that. We have to come to a greater understanding of where we're at. So I wanna thank all the people that put on the summit in December. That was a really significant start. And uh, my hope is that today's presentation won't be as detailed and as long as that day long summit, but I hope it will be able to communicate to our residents and our stakeholders uh, the importance of the issue going on, uh, give them information, uh, there are two parts to this agenda item. The longer part will be uh, these informational presentations, uh, which our Water Resources Department will uh, be helping to coordinate. Um, so it really is a good time for listening and absorbing information. Uh, I know people have questions and comments after the informational presentations. Uh, we're gonna do the best we can within the limits of the time uh, in this particular meeting space to uh, address those questions, um, but I guarantee you, just like at December, I left that summit with many more questions than I had answers. And one result of that is today's agenda item where we can bring some of the same information uh, over to this setting so that our, our public uh, members can participate more fully. There is also a second item on this uh, agenda item, and that would be a draft emergency proclamation. Uh, we will take that up after the informational presentations. Some of you may have concerns specific to that proclamation. So I just wanna make clear that the first part, the longer part of this is gonna be informational only. There's no action proposed, no debate, no votes gonna be taken. We're just gonna process this information and we will accept public input and questions. If you have specific concerns about the draft emergency proclamation, there will be a second opportunity for public input and you can make comments specific to the emergency proclamation later on in this hearing. With that, um, I would like to hand it over. Do we have Marina oh, just online? Just one, one moment. Yeah, so we, we do have uh, Marina. And Marina, are you going to be directing who's speaking at each moment or how's that going to work? Yes, uh, that is correct, um, Chairwoman Paiska. So I will be, um, I have a presentation that I will be sharing and it has which entity is presenting um, that representative from each entity and then I have presentations from each entity. So I'm gonna try and facilitate this the best that I can in terms of sharing my screen and, and the presentations. Okay, wonderful. So we will go through each presentation. I would like to ask the presenters to keep it to 10 minutes. We have eight presentations, so that's, um, a lot of time. We will allow board question and comments between presenters, um, and then we'll follow with public comment at the end of once all the presentations have been completed. Okay. All right, well, good afternoon. I am sharing my screen. Are you guys able to see my share screen? Yeah. 
Perfect. All right. Well, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much, Board of Supervisors and Supervisor Green, especially for facilitating this discussion. Um, as Chairwoman said and Supervisor Green stated, we do have a lot of friends joining us for this item. Um, so I'm going to try my best to facilitate each presentation and kindly requesting that the audience do save your questions and comments for the end just to ensure that we can get through all presentations. So today we are going to be discussing information on the current status of the Clear Lake Hitch and Chai. Um, there is going to be a lot of information tossed your way. So if you do have questions, I just encourage you all to take notes um, as we move through the presentations and we'll all be available at the end for Q&A. All right, so again, we shared there's gonna be a lot of information thrown your way and who is gonna be uh, sharing that information with you. So in order of today's uh, speakers, we have a representative from California Fish and Game Commission. We have representatives from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. We have representatives from Big Valley Band of Pomo Indians, Robinson Rancheria, Chai Council for the Clear Lake Hitch, Lake County Agriculture Advisory Committee, State Water Resource Control Board, and your friends at Lake County Water Resources Department. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to uh, Vice President Erica Zavalada with the California Fish and Game Commission who is gonna get our discussion started. Thank you, Marina, can you hear me? Great. Yes. Good afternoon, Chair Paiska, Vice Chair, Ch Chair Simon and, and members of the board and the public. Thank you for the chance to participate in this crucial conversation. And I'm Erica Zavalletta, Vice President of the California Fish and Game Commission. And I'm just going to provide brief context for this critical issue and how we've come together around it in the last several months. So I won't be going eight or 10 minutes. The emergency situation for Clear Lake Hitch, a native fish that the California Fish and Game Commission listed as threatened almost a decade ago in 2014, was brought to our attention at our August commission meeting last year. We requested input from our close partners at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, which I'll refer to as the department, on the Hitch's status, condition, and recovery efforts at that point. So at our October meeting, data and knowledge presented by the department and tribal representatives made clear that we needed urgent coordination to improve measures to avoid the permanent loss of this fish in Clear Lake. And so also at that October meeting, we asked the department to support bringing together actors to solve this emergency. And the department responded in an amazing way. It quickly co-organized last December's emergency summit with several tribes from the Clear Lake region. And the summit included participation by tribal leadership, staff and members, and representatives of agencies with authority to help address the emergency needs, including the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the California State Water Resources Control Board, the California Department of Water Resources and the Lake County Watershed Protection District. The summit helped establish where we are, what Clear Lake Hitch needs, and what some of the actions are that might meet those needs. It helped start a conversation so that we can work together to identify what each of us can do to remedy the situation and to coordinate, collaborate, and share resources to succeed. This is not a situation that any one entity can resolve. It's all hands on. The Commission supports this board's and the district's official recognition of an emergency and its participation in actions to sustain and recover Clear Lake Hitch, both this year and into the future. And others will speak to the science on the Hitch's status, needs, and specific potential actions. Meanwhile, we remain committed to ensuring this species' persistence despite continued declines since we listed it in 2014. We encourage the district to continue to participate in efforts to monitor and recover Clear Lake Hitch and to take a strong leadership role by identifying supportive actions and measures that it and others of us can take to sustain this fish. Commissioners are encouraged by the evident potential for effective interagency collaboration to successfully address this emergency situation. We look forward to working with you, the department, and other agencies to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Zavaleta. And I would just like to state that we uh, folks on Zoom were getting feedback um, during uh, Vice President Zavaleta's um, discussion. So I just wanna make sure we get that taken care of before we move forward. And it looks like it might be coming from um, the laptop in the board chambers. We have a mic open on your machine. There's feedback in the Zoom room. 
Are you currently hearing the feedback? No. But I did get a few messages from folks in Zoom that were having the same issue. How about, um, I want to make sure that folks are able to hear Commissioner Zavaleta. Okay. My recommendation would be that people uh, speak closer to their microphones. The last speaker was very hard to hear. All right. All right, uh, Commissioner Zavaleta, is there anything um, that you would like to repeat just in case if folks did miss that? I don't wanna make you redo your entire presentation again, but I do wanna make sure that your message was received. Right, that is the question. I want to make sure that folks were able to hear well enough to, to get the sort of the high points of what I said. Um, I think if there's anything that I would want to repeat, and I am still hearing a little bit of feedback, so I Correct. don't know whether other folks can hear me any better, um, is that we want to encourage the district to continue to participate in the work that it has been involved in to monitor and recover the hitch take this strong leadership role to identify supportive actions and measures not only that it can take but also that others of us can take um, and um, this is a collaborative effort you know this is going to take pooled coordination shared resources and so on and so um, i think it's very encouraging to have all of the folks who are participating in this call today um, and i i just want to make sure that um, that folks know that you know we are supportive of, of this effort to collaborate, to coordinate, to improve measures so that we can avoid permanently losing this fish from Clear Lake. Thank Great. you. Thank you so much, uh, Vice President. And I did mute the IT laptop. Um, I hope that was not an issue. Are we still good on all ends? Granicus, Zoom, and the Chambers. It seems fine in here. Okay. It did seem like the feedback was coming from that laptop. So I just want to make sure that we can um, mute that if that's okay moving forward during the presentation. All right, well, it's not oh. a good presentation until we have IT hiccups. So thank you so much, Vice President Zavalada. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on over to Felipe Laluz, Senior Environmental Scientist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Oh, one and second, are we okay, Sam, with everything? The IT laptop has to stay on, otherwise Zoom doesn't hear, or will not hear the participation in the, in the, uh, uh, in the broadcast in the, in the uh, facility. So what was happening is I had the volume up too high because of this last speaker who we could hardly hear. Okay, perfect. So we'll continue to move forward and cross our fingers. Just one other moment. Joan, Joan, Joan Moss. Yeah, hi, over here. Okay, would you mind moving your chair over here out of the way of the exit, please? It's just that I, I wanted you cough, but I wanted to hear it too. Okay. It's, it's just that you're blocking the exit, and we have a lot of people in here. It's better, it's yes. It's better, okay. And if you have to cough, um, maybe being in a room filled with people it's packed to the brim is. Okay. Okay, Marina. Hey. I think we're ready. Great. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, all right, so I'm gonna pass it over to Felipe Leluz, um, who will be giving the next portion of the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Felipe Laluz. I'm a senior environmental scientist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I've been coordinating the department's uh, hitch recovery and restoration efforts uh, since August. Uh, I first became aware of the plight of hitch uh, during the tribal committee meeting that uh, Vice President Zavaleta had mentioned. Um, I do want to thank uh, the Board of Supervisors and all the agencies and entities that have come forward and just acknowledge that this is a situation that is moving much faster than we are used to moving at state agency, as a state agency. Um, and I want to echo uh, the previous comments made in that the 
issues facing Clear Lake Hitch do not fall under the purview of any single entity, and it's gonna take all of us uh, to make sure this species remains on the landscape. Uh, next slide, please. So just a brief species overview, I'm gonna try and keep it to that uh, eight to 10 minute time limit. Uh, Clear Lake Hitch is a subspecies of the Sacramento Hitch, uh, Lavinia excelicata chai is a subspecies name. They were listed as threatened under the California Endangered Species Act in 2014, are endemic to Clear Lake and its tributaries. So this is a unique subspecies that is found nowhere else uh, in the world. Uh, and historically occurred in such abundance that it supported a subsistence fishery. Uh, and to say that it is culturally important is an understatement. As we've heard um, numerous times through over the past couple of months and in prior comments during the listing process. Uh, next slide, please. Some brief notes on the life history. There are a moderate sized minnow reaching lengths of 35 centimeter standard length, so a little over a foot, uh, have a six year lifespan and females mature in their second or third year. So keeping that number in mind, uh, a female hitch has about four years to contribute to the population. Uh, juveniles rear near shore and in tributaries. Uh, able, they're able to move out um, as rapidly as two weeks. However, uh, information that we're gleaning from our fish rescues um, are telling us that we need a better understanding of how they use the tributaries. Uh, the adults occupy deeper water and they feed all life history stages, feed uh, very low on the trophic level, primarily on aquatic invertebrates. Next slide, please. Um, spawn requirements, so this is really getting to the meat of why we're here. Uh, they're potamodromous fish, meaning that they rear and grow mostly uh, in the lake and mature in the lake and then utilize the tributaries to uh, spawn. This spawning run typically occurs from February through May, uh, sometimes extending into June if conditions support it. And they spawn over shallow clean gravel, again, primarily in the tributaries. Uh, there is documentation that some spawning occurs within the lake, um, some historical accounts documented by Kinsey in 1960, uh, based on actual visual observations of, of hitch spawning. Uh, and more recently, Fred Fairer from the USGS, uh, United States Geological Survey, used some more sophisticated uh, geochemistry approaches to show that some spawning does occur in the lake. Uh, this life history, plasticity, or flexibility is not uncommon in California native fishes. Uh, and we believe is one of the mechanisms that allows uh, hitch and other native species to persist. The most uh, common and well-known example is uh, rainbow trout and steelhead, where uh, an adult steelhead can grow up in the ocean, move into fresh water, and have a um, offspring that, that live their entire lives within fresh water as a rainbow trout. And this sort of life history plasticity allows hitch and other species to uh, take advantage of these boom years uh, and create big enough populations to get them through the bust years. You know, we all know that California's hydrology is very variable. Um, back to spawning within the lakes, uh, Kimsey also in those observations uh, reported uh, predation uh, by common carp, uh, just directly visual observation, watching the hitch spawn and then watching carp move in and consume those eggs. Uh, and egg, um, you know, spawning within the lake and in the tributaries can also be um, limited by desiccation. And this picture here on the right shows just how shallow that spawning habitat can be and how a moderate drop in, in water levels can result in stranded and desiccated eggs. Next slide, please. Uh, for the population trends, uh, initially I'm gonna start off with our 2014 uh, status review. Status review is a big component of the listing process and initially looked at historical accounts and oral histories uh, of large spawning runs that crowded the tributaries. Uh, I believe most famously Livingston Stone's account um, describing hitch runs that uh, made uh, creeks unable to cross. Uh, they were so crowded with fish. Uh, these runs could consist of tens of thousands of Clear Lake Hitch and the now extinct Clear Lake Split Tail, and likely also uh, contain blackfish and suckers uh, and other native, native fishes. Um, and so just keep this anecdotal data or information in mind. This is sort of the first uh, or earliest data. Uh, the status review also looked at commercial catch data and uh, a few others. 
a few other data sources, and it just showed that hitch populations are extremely variable, again, reflecting that boom and bust ecology that we see throughout a lot of California. Um, next slide, please. The status review uh, also looked at um, data collected by the Chai Council for Clear Lake Hitch. Um, this is their volunteer survey data, and this is just showing um, that the number of spawning tributaries uh, correlates with hydrology. Um, you know, I apologize, there's, there's black and blue spots here which don't show up very well in this figure, uh, but you can look at this in our 2014 status review, it's figure three. So to the left, uh, 2005 and 2006 were, you know, above normal wet years uh, in which hitch were observed in 11 and 12 of the tributaries. Uh, and then we move into 2007 and 8, which were below normal or dry years. And here we see uh, that the number of spotting tributaries uh, decreased. And then that pattern repeats itself, you know, 2010 and 2011. 2011 being an especially wet and cold spring, uh, you know, allowed for hitch to occupy more of the tributaries. And then fast forward to 2013, um, an extremely dry year and the beginning of a more recent drought. Uh, hitch were only observed in three of those uh, tributaries. I believe it was Kelsey, Adobe, and Coal Creeks. Uh, next slide, please. So moving uh, on in the progression is how we get more um, sophisticated and more targeted surveys. Uh, CDFW began the visual spawning survey in 2014. Uh, this is a bit more standardized in that it uh, visited fixed locations. So it visited 21 sites across seven streams uh, from 2014 to present uh, to 2022. And in 2022, only 306 individuals were observed. 56% uh, of the observations reported a dry stream bed. And here we see a picture on the right of Adobe Creek uh, taken on March 15th of last year. Uh, you know, right at a time when the spawning runs should be occurring, uh, habitat, an important tributary for Clear Lake Hitch was dry. Um, I'm going to move on now to some more other uh, surveys. Um, next slide, please. Uh, more recently, um, in addition to the visual uh, surveys conducted by the department, the United States Geological Survey has begun a summer gillnet survey to monitor Clear Lake Hitch. And this plot uh, is pretty simple. Uh, this, this slide and the, sorry, this figure and the next figure were provided by Fred Fair of the USGS who leads this effort, the summer gillnet effort. Um, and here we see just basically between 2018 and 2019, a pretty substantial decline uh, in the population. And then going over to 2022, just note how narrow those error bars are. Uh, and this just is a little bit of nuance in that they were more consistently not catching fish. So more sampling events resulted in zero. Uh, taking a deeper dive into this data, next slide please. Uh, this is that same data again provided uh, by, by Fred Fairer. Uh, this is a length frequency plot, which is a pretty typical tool that we use to examine uh, the structure of a population. Um, each panel is a year of that data with the height of the bars corresponding to the number of fish and the position of the bar corresponding to the size of the fish. So on the left side, we have smaller fish. On the right side, we have uh, larger fish with that vertical dashed line uh, being the distinction between the juvenile and the adult life stages. So looking at the top panel in 2017, we see a strong cohort uh, relative to the other fish that were collected. Uh, and this is what we expect to see uh, in a fish population. A lot of juveniles, the most abundant life stage in the, in, in the population overall. And as those juveniles grow into adults, some of them die uh, from predation, disease, other natural causes or other, um, you know, other causes of, of mortality. The next panel down in 2018, we see that strong cohort signal moving to the right. So that means that these fish are growing uh, they're surviving, you know, they're maturing at this size, they're able to spawn. Um, but looking to the left of that line, we see very minimal juvenile recruitment. And then moving on into 2019, 2020, and 2022, or sorry, 2021 and 2022, um, we see that pattern repeat itself and the continued decline in which there are no juveniles recruiting to the population. And in 2022, 
only six individuals were collected, including two juveniles. Uh, so this is the equivalent of, of no children um, being born uh, over multiple generations. And I, I apologize to whoever uh, first used that analogy to describe this, but I, I think it's, you know, I, I apologize for not giving you credit where credit is due. I've heard that analogy before to describe this population trend, um, but it's an apt description and really drives home the point that there is a bottleneck um, somewhere between adults um, laying eggs or having high quality eggs uh, and juveniles surviving to adulthood or multiple bottlenecks that we need to address. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there are many factors affecting the decline of Clear Lake Hitch. Um, first and foremost, uh, we want to highlight the loss of spawning and marine habitat, again referring to that 2014 status review. There was an estimated 92% loss of historically available habitat due to physical barriers, either in the forms of dams or levees or other um, structures within the stream. Um, again, speaking to how important it is to have access, you know, the area, the amount of, of habitat available uh, does affect the number of fish that uh, that habitat can produce and support. We also need to look at the quality of habitat. Uh, in addition to having water in these trib tributaries, we need to look at riparian vegetation along, along the banks to ensure that there's sufficient shade to maintain water temperature uh, that they can survive in, as well as providing cover from predators. Um, some of these uh, other effects are more ephemeral in nature. Um, so we think of a barrier as like a dam, but some barriers can also be uh, associated with a massive, a rapid decline uh, in stream flow, uh, which leads to strandings, uh, desiccation of adults, eggs, and juveniles. And this uh, image here uh, was taken by my colleague Ben Ewing in uh, March of 2014, showing an adult stranding event. And I'm sure this, this image will, um, will appear in other presentations. Uh, this happened right after a large flow event in which a lot of hitch, adult hitch were able to enter the stream uh, and the stream uh, flow declined too rapidly for the adults to move out. Uh, not to mention any eggs that they may have produced uh, would have also been stranded. Um, other factors, of course, non-native species, uh, both competition and predation. Um, in competing with food resources. Again, they feed low on the trophic level, so there's potential that they could compete with, uh, be outcompeted by threadfin shad, uh, as well as inland silversides. And inland silversides in other areas have been identified uh, as predators on larvae and eggs. And of course, we can't um, talk about Clear Lake without talking about water quality and contaminants, uh, particularly harmful algal blooms and dissolved oxygen uh, in the summertime. Um, so again, many factors affecting the decline, but we believe that the main factor, the main mechanism occurs somewhere in, in the production of juveniles. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the efforts that we are taking to address um, the decline, we summarized in a letter of support to the county sent to Director De Leon on the 13th. And again, we encourage collaboration with us and the other entities and agencies uh, at the table to examine releases for Adobe uh, at Adobe and Highland Springs Reservoir. Uh, the department has provided previous comments um, indicating that we have concerns about the timing of releases and how they may uh, impact Clear Lake Hitch. Uh, and we are also um, encourage collaboration on further examination of the groundwater surface uh, sorry, groundwater surface water interconnectivity uh, to get a better idea of how groundwater pumping uh, may affect um, stream beds. And again, just to reiterate um, in that letter and to repeat again here, we encourage collaboration both in the emergency effort that's occurring in the Clear Lake Hitch Task Force and the State Water Resources Control Board Implementation Team and longer term strategies like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Conservation Strategy Team. Um, so these two teams, you know, the task force and the implementation team are more of a rapid response uh, as opposed to a longer term um, uh, conservation plan. Um, but these groups have a lot of overlap and we're all going to need together to, to keep these fish on the landscape. Next slide, please. These next two slides, uh, I just wanted to include as reference for 
for folks. Um, there's been some confusion about the responsibilities and roles uh, and the permitting process, which I will readily admit can be, can be uh, confusing and frustrating. Um, but these slides, please refer to them. They will be included in the materials. Uh, and I uh, want to emphasize that we're here to help. Um, we can provide consultations, provide information, uh, and I would direct any interested parties to email r2info, so that's region two is our department's region that includes Clear Lake, uh, at wildlife.ca.gov for more information. And we'll put you in touch with staff that can help you uh, navigate the permitting process. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is just a checklist. Uh, again, I encourage you, if you are doing work near uh, or in a stream bed to look at this permit and contact us. Um, you know, again, culverts, uh, any maintenance or road bridge crossing within the water course, please contact us and uh, work with us to um, assess if you need a permit and, and how to navigate that process. Next slide, please. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, you know, there's a lot of momentum uh, surrounding Clear Lake Hedge, largely driven by this rapid population decline. And this is uh, a part of a longer term decline that we've observed. Uh, it's supported by the qualitative comparison of oral accounts in the visual survey, as well as the more quantitative assessment of the recent USGS data. And we believe it's driven by the near complete juvenile recruitment failure, uh, which we've observed in recent years. Uh, and we're here to help with permitting and restoration, uh, as well as working with our you know, partners developing better science and addressing data gaps. And again, no single entity has the power or authority to solve these issues. It's gonna take all of us working together. Um, and I believe this is my last slide. Yes, thank you. Do we have anything from the board before our next presentation? Okay. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over now to Sarah Ryan, Environmental Director with Big Valley Band of Pomo Indians. And I believe Sarah is there in person. And I will throw up her presentation. I think I can do all of this on this. Do you need to come sit up here? I, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe that'd be easier. Okay, okay. thanks. Can I push the button? <coughs> Underneath. Uh, it's. Yeah. <laughs> it works very well. <laughs> so, good afternoon. Um, thank you for thank you for allowing us to speak about the Clear Lake Hitch, the Chai, today. Um, my name is Sarah Ryan. I'm the Environmental Director for the Big Valley Band of Pomo Indians. And I'm mostly going to be looking that way since it's really big and I've got new glasses. <laughs> so um, the mantra, the logo, the, the refrain that we've all been saying for uh, most of uh, last summer and, and through now is no more loss of species on our watch. Uh, we, uh, I've heard it from the agencies, I've heard it from tribal leadership, uh, other leadership, and certainly as staff for the tribe, um, we don't want to have, um, have this, the Clear Lake Hitch go extinct. And once we heard from this state biologist that unless some big, big things change, uh, we'll be losing these, uh, we will most likely lose a species, it really threw us into high gear. So I, I do want to show um, on this slide that uh, we are going to have a few slides on enforcement, creek water usage, and some of our recommendations that we made during the Clear Lake Hitch Summit in, 20, in uh, December. Um, and we also have a lot of people at Big Valley who are very involved in Clear Lake Hitch um, in terms of their whole life cycle. And some of those folks are in the audience today, and I just want to thank them all for coming. Um, and I, I know there are uh, other tribes uh, who uh, and tribal members who are here as well and tribal leadership, so thank you for, for coming. Uh, the right picture, the picture on the right is an example of what uh, somebody, a farmer has done to make sure that there's enough water in his irrigation pond for his vineyard. Um, we had to work really hard with CDFW wardens for a number of years to actually get that 
ditch that that person created as, as well as those boulders removed. Uh, he then put in a well which is about five feet from the creek uh, to make and lined his uh, his pond uh, to make sure that he had enough water for his vineyard. But that is something that, you know, um, we have all have to be vigilant about if there's water crossings that are uh, reducing the downstream water. It's happening um, in, in multiple places around the, around the county, and it is something that impacts the Clear Lake Hitch because it means less water downstream, and the hitch can't get past that. So next slide, please. The slide that uh, Felipe just showed, I have on here as well. And I just want to point out that Clear Lake Hitch are in the news right now. You see some headlines. Um, there's also some publications about it. There's research. Uh, and as I mentioned, both state and federal biologists have identified a drastic reduction in the number of Clear Lake Hitch and have stated that unless more is done, we'll lo the, lose the hitch within five years. Next slide, please. So enforcement. So relying on enforcement can be problematic. People have to report their neighbors. That is not always fun. Nobody wants to do that. So, uh, and, and it is not, you know, because of budgets and whatnot, it's not like there's wardens and other law enforcement that are out looking for issues. But a few years ago, I wanted to look at how many times Fish and Game Code uh, 1600, which is basically stream bank, stream bed uh, violations, uh, how often that went to the DA's office and how often it was prosecuted. Because I had heard that there was a problem with that. And sure enough, <laughs> after looking at the data, we found that about 13% of the time, and looking in a five-year period, there was actually corrective action taken. In a lot of cases, it was dismissed because not enough data, or what the wardens did was just try to handle it in-house, um, tell the people to throw some straw down, which is one particular um, case I'm familiar with. So violations have to be reported, and also enforcement often doesn't lead to corrections made. So we can't just expect that law enforcement is going to be out there handling the illegal diversions and some of the other things that are causing um, both a degraded habitat as well as uh, loss of water. Next slide, please. So we've noted that, um, uh, and I have a slide showing this, but um, the, the spawning season for the chai, um, historically versus now, is about cut in half. The creeks do not run, the major tributaries of Clear Lake do not run during the time when the Clear Lake Hitch Fry need to be returning to the lake. So as was mentioned in earlier presentations, the, the, the adults go upstream, they spawn, they make it back down to the lake, hopefully, but then those eggs have to hatch, it takes a certain amount of time, they have to hang out there, they have to eat, and then they have to get back. Well, when you already have it down to the lake and survive all of that, when you already have a spawning season which, or a time frame when the creeks are running is even reduced in half, that is um, limiting the number of, of survivors. And as uh, several people have already said, it's a juvenile recruitment failure. So, and, and tribes and researchers have, have long noted that the chai are struggling. Um, we also know that there's agricultural water demand in and along the creeks, and often it coincides with the chai spawning and return of the fry to the lake. There is little data on agricultural use except in honor system use and reporting, and it is often sporadically uh, submitted with the agencies. They've had to do like orders to get the data to come in. Uh, the, the frost protection, uh, which is going to come up multiple times a day, including from the agricultural folks, uh, who say that this is, they're not impacting, um, the surface water flow in the creeks. But we do know that we have seen that <coughs> happening. And, um, the fact that there's not a lot of data of when and how and where they use it is something that, that we can all see and, uh, and review, um, is a problem. We, we also think that just in general that, that the, our agencies, all of us, the county, the tribes, that we have not prioritized data collection on surface water use, groundwater use, and land use. Um, and, and that has been a focus for Big Valley's um, environmental department. We are primary, and we are primary focused in the Big Valley Creeks. You're going to hear me mainly talking about the Big Valley Creeks because these are part of the ancestral lands of the tribe. And they are the regular places where tribal members congregate to catch a fish and manage the natural resources through many, many generations of stewardship knowledge. Uh, another thing about the Big Valley Creeks, so a recent study of USGS on the strontium levels in the Clear Lake Hitch, that's so basically in their ear bones, show that more fish originate in Adobe Creek than any other creeks. So we're really focused on Adobe. Biologists know that a healthy population of fish 
requires that the population is spread out in multiple areas to reduce disease and other issues. So even though people are saying, you know, you could say, well, Middle Creek is fine. Kelsey Creek is fine. No, you have to have, the biologists say you have to have more uh, more location um, than, than just a couple for them to, uh, to stay healthy. And finally, um, we know that other Big Valley Creeks, Cole, Manning, and Thompson, have water quantity issues, and they can't support a robust population of the chai. But we've mainly been focusing on adobe because of its absolute proximity to Big Valley lands, um, and also because we know it has the most severe problem. Next slide, please. This, um, this graphic uh, shows that, um, it, it shows that timing of irrigation, frost protection, spring irrigation, whatever you want to call it, and also the flow of, um, uh, this is showing Kelsey Creek, the blue is Kelsey Creek in a wet year, so you can see spike, 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 that's like heavy rains, it stops, and then in a dry year is like one big spike in February, and then the, the flow is very low. Well, during this time when the water is drawing down, that is when there's frost protection, there's even irrigation, and you can see right in that window that there are fish kills and fish rescues happening in multiple creeks. Um, and over the last eight years, there have been multiple documented fish kills and fish rescues in creeks during their spawning period because there's not enough water in the creeks. That's the bottom line. Next slide, please. So our first recommendation was that there were surface uh, to the agencies uh, and also, um, you know, just to, to the county, that there are surface water contaminants on all Clear Lake creeks for declared dry years during the chai spawning season. There is a precedent for that. Yolo County doesn't get Clear Lake water when it's below a certain amount. There's already a precedent. Um, next slide, please. So um, the tri uh, Big Valley, uh, ha and with their hydrologist cons um, consultants and others, um, have been doing quite a bit of uh, modeling and monitoring on Adobe Creek. In 2020, we completed a study on Adobe Creek to try to improve identification of in-stream habitat in areas of potential stranding. What you see here is that as the, um, so at the top it says CFS, so it's cubic feet per second, so it's basically the flow. As the flow reduces and you, um, as you go down through, you go through April and May, you can see where the squares are that, I've, uh, that, that are outlined here is where, uh, where there are um, stranding. It, it's not going to be deep enough. There's not enough flow. And therefore, these are, there are multiple locations by May where they can be stranded and even somewhere between April and May. Now, this is just, um, this is just uh, using a, a one-dimensional hydraulic modeling. Um, we're now moving into a 2D modeling. But it, it really is important to have enough flow in there to get over the barriers to deal with the land and, and, and to have that flow in there for the full length of time that the, the fry need to make it back um, to the lake. And so we found that as water flow reduced below 34 cubic feet per second, many locations on Adobe Creek became impassable for the hitch given their depth requirements. Next slide, please. So just to kind of um, uh, back to that slide uh, or to show a little more detail on that, um, we have uh, been looking into these things since 2017, particularly in Adobe Creek, um, with uh, various sources of funding. Next slide, please. This slide is pretty busy. Uh, it's using a State Water Resources Control Board slide that they showed during their listening session. That upper slide is showing um, the, the, these are surface water diversions. So it's when people have pipes into the creeks throughout the whole county and what they're using it for. And this is all based on the data that people have to submit if they um, have water rights on a creek, which is basically um, everybody who's got, uh, almost everybody who's got, um, who lives adjacent to a creek has uh, those uh, types of rights and are allowed to put that water to beneficial use. But we question whether there's enough in the creeks for all users, which includes the flows needed for the chai to spawn and for their young to return to the creeks. The, the chart on the bottom is our own review of those same uh, reports, uh, statement of diversion and use reports that go into the water boards, and it's showing the what people are using it for. They have to report it. They're using it for frost protection between March and May. They're doing, um, you know, 75 acre feet of water for frost protection. That's one particular one for, this is Adobe Creek. This is just a snapshot. Um, 
of uh, some of the usage that's happening. So it's their own reporting that uh, we're basing this on. Uh, and the demand is high. Um, and uh, if the, you look at the CDFW letter that just uh, came in to you, uh, they say that uh, for groundwater usage and for the wells that are near the creeks, that CDFW, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, expects that a meaningful portion of stream flow depletion is attributable to shallow groundwater extraction. So all those wells that are placed near the creeks, um, they're placed near there for a reason. Um, and so when they're pumping, and they're pumping for frost protection or other uses, um, it is to uh, be able to, uh, it's, it's having an impact on the creeks is what CDFW is expecting. And it's also what um, our review did in the Big Valley Groundwater Sustainability Advisory Committee that we were in. Um, and the, the water, uh, State Water Resources Control Board map on the top part shows that many diversions are occurring in the main, main chai spawning creeks and the data shows that it's during the spawning times. Next slide, please. So another of our recommendations is that Adobe Creek and other creeks need some gauges so we can see actually what the flow is. And matter of fact, the tribes um, this particular year and other, you know, moving forward, we're going to have people out on a daily basis is my understanding. I know we're planning that with Big Valley in our area to look at specific areas to see if stranding is starting to happen, if the water level has dropped uh, uh, to, uh, to the point where we're going to have um, stranded fish. But having live reading gauge in there is also going to be incredibly helpful. We are also asking for, you know, we are doing modeling and data collection, so are other tribes, and this is something that needs to be supported. It's not like there's just a ton of money going around. I mean, it's, these are expensive things to do. Next slide, please. Um, so this is, uh, we recently had um, LIDAR flown of all of Adobe Creek from top to bottom, um, and, uh, it, and we're able to do some additional two-dimensional hydrodynamic modeling, and our preliminary results um, were showing, if you look at the red sections along this portion of Adobe Creek, this is also where a chai stranding occurred uh, uh, this last year, um, that there are multiple places that, again, uh, chai will be stranded uh, at um, the one CFS that is what we're seeing at, um, you know, the, kind of some of the critical times of when the chai are spawning. We do also have, um, the tribe has pressure transducers on Adobe Creek, and we are also working with local well owners in multiple locations to put in static water level indicator readers um, so that we can see what the groundwater is doing and what the surface water is doing. So this is data that we've shared before, multiple arenas, um, as well as with the water boards as they're doing their review of this. Next slide, please. So that, that 2D stream flow modeling in Adobe Creek, um, the preliminary modeling indicates that water depths become too shallow for the hitch below a flow of 34 cubic feet per second. And also multiple years of data um, shows that at the top of Adobe Creek, it's just like at the top of Kelsey Creek, it's great. Nobody's bothered up there. There's a lot of water. Uh, but as it's moving down toward the lake and there's all these users all the way down, it's a losing creek, which means the creek has less water in it the closer you get to the lake. And that is something that is, you know, based on demand and some other, you know, uh, various other reasons. This is why we need the agricultural data uh, of their usage as well as a better understanding of uh, the, just the hyd hydrologic work that's happening um, within those reaches. Uh, Big Valley and Lake County are finalizing an MOU to install a pressure transducer below Highland Springs Reservoir because we really want to understand how much water is actually leaving the reservoir and be able to factor that into some of our modeling. So hopefully that will be um, finished soon. Next slide, please. Um, this is actually a graphic of some of the uh, showing uh, ad uh, at Adobe Creek uh, near Soda Bay Road. Um, we have a, a, a um, well watcher, basically, so a, a sonic water level indicator in one of the wells that are nearby, as well as a pressure transducer. So it's showing, if you look at that December, January, February, the one thing we can say for certain is that um, while the groundwater, so you see the, the, there's a flow, so that blue is flow, but as the well is recharging, and there wasn't much rain during this, as we all know, as the, as the well is recharging, and so that's the green line going up, the, the surface water level is going down in, the, um, in that same area, because we have stuff right in that same spot. Um, 
as uh, the other thing this can tell us for certain is that that last little blip before the red line is when a little rain happened. The chai were like, yes, they started going up the creeks and there was an immediate drawdown because everything was so depleted. It gets depleted during this time. So that little rain barely made any difference. It was uh, disappeared very quickly and that's why that chai stranding occurred and an observed fish kill um, in April which is when you know we would really want to be seeing a lot of hitch in there next slide so the tribe is also asking for uh, and recommends that uh, there is a release of water that maintains that 34 cubic feet per second or somewhere around there. Like we said, we're finishing the modeling. We know the water boards and CDFW are also looking at that. But we do believe uh, for Adobe Creek, one of the solutions can be um, a release of water from the reservoirs during the um, historic spawning period. We also support aquifer recharge projects, which will keep that groundwater level um, higher. Next slide, please. Um, we also recommend that there is groundwater pumping curtailments uh, near the Clear Lake Creeks for declared dry years during the chai spawning season. As I mentioned, as you can see with the graph, there is absolutely a connection between groundwater pumping and what is going on with uh, how much surface water is left. We did provide an evaluation of that in the Big Valley Groundwater Sustainability Plan. We did reject the, that plan uh, and recommended to DWR uh, that it gets uh, corrected for the issues that we saw um, with the uh, evaluation and uh, of the data. Um, and of course, we haven't heard back what they're the answer to that is, but we are hoping that they will um, improve it based on other data. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, the, uh, the CHI can't wait for perfect data. There is data already. We've got some data and we think that there's enough to move forward with improved water management. We also think that agricultural water use data sharing is needed um, and, and actually, um, you know, factual, uh, equipment um, data would be quite nice uh, because a lot of it is anecdotal and that can be problematic. Um, and I just want to point out that uh, there uh, is literature and there is research from uh, Fred Fayer who is, uh, I know, um, participating in the call or in this meeting today or available. Uh, he is with USGS and uh, his, uh, he says that the uh, fry, it might take between 11 and 152 days for the fry to make it back to Clear Lake. So it's not just, oh, in a week and a half, they're gone. Uh, and matter of fact, uh, I believe that um, Robinson Rancheria's biologist might be speaking about something, you know, a rescue that they had to do quite a few months after um, what we see as a chai spawning run. So we do believe that curtailments are necessary during the dry years and that better management of the water needs to happen now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are any comments between speakers, between this presentation and the next, or are we ready for the next one? Okay. Great. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to pass it over to Luis Santana, fisheries biologist with Robinson Rancheria, who is with you in the join, or in the Zoom, or excuse me, in the board chamber. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the biology. Uh, I'm going to focus more on habitat and what we're already doing to, you know, try to work around the habitat that we have, and then just potential for restoration of that habitat. So this is just showing uh, the Big Valley Basin, um, and the reason I'm showing this is because last spring I participated in a uh, adult hitch rescue with CDFW um, that Big Valley Rancher Rancher reported to them, and so we went into Adobe Creek to um, perform some of this rescue, and it included other tribes in the area: Robinson Rancheria, Habimental, Upper Lake, Big Valley. I think that was it at the time, but it was. There's also CDFW employees there and uh, local citizens. So this is just showing uh, the mouth of Adobe Creek to about Soda Bay Road. Um, actually, I think that's East Finley uh, next to it. 
Um, and so the blue part is showing what was wet at this time. And so this was late April and early May. And so there's Highway 29. Um, you can't really see them, but there's, there's um, dots where I mark different types of habitat. So riffles, pools, runs, just um, different things that I saw in the stream. And then again, the blue is what was wet. And so there was good habitat right next to Highway 29, but there's disconnections um, in between there and Soda Bay throughout. And so this is one of the, this is um, upstream of Highway 29 to about Bell Hill Road. And there's actually a really good section of habitat available for hitch to spawn and rear in. Uh, but when the streams do go dry, they lose their access back to the lake. Um, and last year, that whole stretch went dry, so anything that did survive after May didn't make it. And so this is showing the reservoirs, um, some from about Bell Hill Road to the reservoirs. And there is some wetted habitat in the area as well, but again, there's a lot of disconnections. So I believe this is showing um, where we did most of the rescues. You can't really see the dots on here. Uh, yeah, so the red dots, uh, they're near Soda Bay Road. That's where um, we initially started the rescues. And I believe there was four pools there. I wish I would have made it a little bit bigger now. but um, So there was four pools where we started getting some adults. And then we moved upstream near East Finley Road. And that's where we got the majority of the 293 adults that we did end up rescuing. And so that's just some of the stream stuff. So now I'm gonna talk about some of the lake um, habitat uh, quality. But just to preface this, uh, the streams do provide a lot of cool water to the lake and dissolve oxygen. And it's one of the things that not just hitch need, but all the other fishes in the system. So one of the projects we're working on is a carp and goldfish um, management because even if you want to get rid of one species of fish, so a non-native in this lake, it's going to be nearly impossible because one, it's so massive and two, there's a lot of ponds in the basin that could flood over and just restock the lake and there's also people that could just restock the lake with any kind of species of fish. So I'm going to focus on our carp and goldfish management. Um, and so a lot of people don't really know uh, the damaging, the ecological damage that carp and goldfish do. And so one, one of the biggest things is they increase the internal phosphorus loading. And they do this during, during foraging and during uh, spawning. So if you guys go out during the spawning of the carp near the shoreline, like last year it was basically mid-March to mid-April. Um, and near the shoreline, you'll see it's just dark. And at this time, there was no storm. So I was like, oh, what's going on? And so I walked out into the lake a little bit, and it was just carp spawning. So um, carp could get pretty big, 50-plus pounds. So they can move a lot of dirt. And that's one of the problems um, with them in this lake. Because even if there's nutrients being transported by the streams into the lake, what the carp are doing is digging down into the, uh, into the lake bed and we're not talking about inches, we're talking about feet. So they uncover certain nutrients in the lake and make it available. Um, and so in shallow lakes, they're very successful. So one of the, one of the um, co-managers in this is uh, WSB out of Wisconsin. They, they focus on carp and goldfish eradication in small ponds in the Midwest. Um, and so one of the reasons we want to kind of manage the population is to try to get rid of their degradation of the ecology, the habitat of not just the hitch, but other native fishes as well. <clears throat> so in some studies of, on these lakes, they showed a negative relationship in macrophy abundance and carp biomass. So basically what macrophy is, is uh, the food available for other native fishes. Um, so elevated carp biomass, so just overall uh, weight of carp resulted in 71% of northern wild rice distribution on Clam Lake in Burnett County, Wisconsin. And so here it's just like, oh, we don't have wild rice. But you could kind of compare that to Thule's. Um, 
these carp get big, and you know we do have uh, some good tule beds, but it's probably a good assumption that the carp could kind of unbed some of these tules, especially the younger ones that aren't well established. And so this is actually showing one of the wild rice experiments. On the left is a fenced off seeded area. So they seeded it with wild rice and they kept carp out. And then the middle left, um, no fencing, but they spread seed. And the middle right, it's, uh, they fenced it off and didn't seed. And then on the right is open and seeded. So as you could tell, if you keep the carp out, uh, vegetation is allowed to grow. So uh, reduction in habitat, so plants and food, can result um, in reduced native fish's abundance, diversity, and size structure. So when you take their habitat and food away, their populations decline. Uh, Weber and Brown found an inverse relationship between relative abundance, so the catch per unit effort, of native fishes and common carp across 81 lakes in South Dakota, specifically black crappie, bluegill, white bass, and northern pike. So I mentioned this because we have crappie and bluegill here. We also have um, three different species of bass. So uh, last year we started phase one of our study. And so the catch per unit effort for carp and goldfish on Clear Lake was not established. So what we did was we established that. And so um, what we assessed was that if we had any 89 pounds of carp per acre in the lake, it was ecologically damaging. Uh, so we chose to complete the abundance estimate using a boat electrofishing catch per unit effort model. So this was done with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, so the next thing we did was we tagged 30 specimens. So this was 20, I believe 21 carp and nine goldfish. Um, so the whole point of this uh, to tag these fish is because they congregate in the winters and especially before they spawn. So if we know where they're congregating, we know where to go in and get them and just get, um, get rid of them as much as possible. Uh, so this is one of the congregating behaviors. It's just a, a nice little table. Um, they showed them, they followed them seasonally and it's, it's very predictable once you do have them tagged and, and you could locate them. Um, so eradication, if possible, in these kind of areas, that's where we would focus on it. And there's different ways to get rid of them. We're not entirely sure how we're going to do it. That's one of the reasons we're going to do a feasibility study in the next couple weeks, just so we could get a better idea of how to approach this situation. Uh, so I already started uh, monitoring where they're moving. And because our boat is down, I've only been going along the lake on the roads. but we can see that they're starting to congregate on the um, north shore of the upper body and the lower arm. And I'm not entirely sure why they're doing that. My hypothesis is that's the one that they're, there's the most sun in those areas. So it's a little bit warmer for them because they are a, a warm body or warm water fish. Um, so this is just showing congregating behaviors uh, um, in the months that it was occurring. So as you can see, the white is uh, what was going on in December. And so they are showing a congregation pattern. So these are just my sources. Um, yeah, so th the habitat thing, I, th I think I want to, you know, I do want to address that we obviously we are in a drought. But the other thing is our streams are no longer natural. Um, they're more straight. And in valleys, they should be meandering back and forth. And so when they're straight like that, the water just goes. It doesn't slow down. It takes away from replenishing an aquifer. So when they're able to meander, just back and forth, if you guys know what an oxbow lake is, um, they create oxbows, the water becomes slower, and so our aquifers are able to fill up. Um, and you know, there's ways to do restoration efforts like that, but it definitely cannot be done by just one group of people. Uh, one team. It's definitely a collaborative effort. And so, you know, in the in the year that I've been here, I've been able to work with all the tribes in the area, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, USGS, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, 
higher education institutes, Cal Poly Humboldt, UC Berkeley, UC Davis. So it takes a lot of people to be able to um, actually do restoration efforts for fishes. And you know, one of the one of the things, like Sarah mentioned, we did do a, another rescue last year, and it was uh, us, Robinson Rancheria, the county, and Habimoto Pomo of Upper Lake. And this was done in Cooper Creek. It's on the north end of Tule Lake. Um, so if you're passing Bachelor Ballot, going towards Ukiah, it's one of those creeks. And so Caltrans reported seeing uh, fishes that were stranded in this puddle. And so Ben Ewing from California Department of Fish and Wildlife sent me this email, sent me a picture. He's like, hey, can you just do me a favor and just go make sure that there's no hitch in there? And so I'm like, yeah, sure. And in the picture, you could see clearly that there, it was carp. Um, so when I got there, I didn't see any carp, but I had my net with me. So I did stick my net in this puddle that looked like, it just looked like mud. It was like completely brown. And so I caught 10 hitch, 10 juvenile hitch. And um, they're about this big. And so this was in August. So this was in a creek in August. And so the spawning run would have occurred probably in April on that side of the lake, just because it's a little bit colder. Um, so, I mean, we, we don't necessarily know all the impacts that are occurring because all the streams are very different. So for example, some Sacramento sucker have already started their spawning run. Um, and so hearing that, I went out to Middle Creek um, to the locations where I know they would go. And I had a feeling they weren't gonna be there just because uh, flows were still too high and the water was too cold. And you know, that was the case. They, they like to um, go based off of temperature and dissolved oxygen. And so they wait till it warms up a little bit after storms and then they start making their migratory run. And in Middle Creek, I thought it was a case that that wasn't going to occur because there's a lot more water in Middle Creek. And so we, we have to be able to work together in many areas to actually understand what's going on because every spawning run of hitch is gonna be different. And the last species to go extinct was actually here, the Clear Lake split tail, a very close relative to the Clear Lake hitch. It would spawn in the streams after the hitch. And so, <clears throat> their water was no longer available in April and May when they would be spawning, and especially when they were making their way back down to the lake. And then once they got to the lake, they'd have to compete with non-native species that were introduced to their habitat niche, which is near shore. So the, the hitch are able to go out into the middle of the lake and avoid competition with non-native species, where the split tail, they inhabited the same parts as all the other um, species which was near shore. So that's one of the reasons they went extinct. And with that, I'll take any questions. Do we have anything for the board or next presentation? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Louise. I am gonna go ahead and pass it over to Peter Windrum, the president of the Chai Council for the Clear Lake Hitch, who is joining <coughs> you all in the board chambers. Just checking, Marina, real quickly, do you have the other set of um, slides that I sent you this afternoon, or did I send you these? I have this one, but I can check uh, real quick, Peter, um, just to make sure I have the most recent one. Thank you. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a moment, if that's okay.
If not, we'll do, we can certainly make do with that one. I believe I have it. Just give me um, a few seconds as it is downloading. Um, if it's going to take more than 35 seconds, I'll go back to the one I had up there initially. Thank you. You want to give yourself an introduction? Sure. I'll do this real quick, <laughs> quickly. Thank you. My name is Peter Windrum. Um, I, to give you my little bit of background and qualifications to offer the opinions here, I've lived on Kelsey Creek um, my entire lifetime and on a family farm that's been in generations for a long time but compares not the slightest to the history of the native folks. We've, <laughs> by our standards, it's been there a while. I'm a co-owner of a vineyard on Kelsey Creek that we planted in 1971. Today it's a 10-acre uh, Sauvignon Blanc vineyard, um, and it uh, is the subject of a test that we're, I'm going to demonstrate here in a moment, or not a, information. I'm also the uh, co-founder of the Chai Council for the Clear Lake Hitch. The Chai Council was... F okay. That's right, we'll do, we'll do that one fine. Um, can we go to the next slide and we'll just, and the next. Okay, um, but let me just tell you a bit more about myself. I was, uh, the Chai Council was formed in 2004 by a group of us under the auspices of the um, then Westlake um, Resource Conservation uh, de a department, or CD, and it the mission of the Chai Council was and, and has been uh, to for the protection of the Clear Lake Hitch. The reason that we formed it and that I initiated all of that was because I grew up on Kelsey Creek and watched Hitch all my life from the time I was a child and was aware of the numbers, vast numbers on the creek, vast numbers. And we used to play with them, my sisters and I, on the creek. We rode our horses. That was the biggest thing to do in March, was go racing up and down the creek, chasing hitch, because the numbers were so huge. And um, I care for the hitch greatly, and did then, and knew how important they were, and over the years saw their numbers decline. And in particularly starting at about the 1970s and then on from then. Uh, the, what the Chai Council did, and the reason I say did is because it's been nearly 20 years since we found the council. We had a, uh, a group of volunteers, dedicated volunteers. At one point we had as many as 70 volunteers monitoring Hitch in, in Big Valley, all over every tributary to Clear Lake. Well, all those folks are like me. They've gotten very much older. Many of them, some have passed away. Others have moved away. And so our numbers have shrunk. Right now, the, basically, the Chai Council consists of being a, a, a guardian of records. Uh, and the records that we generated, as you'll see in a moment, were those um, that were used by the Center for Biological Diversity to make the case that the hitch were declining in such numbers that they needed protection. Those were Chai Council records. The way we monitored hitch very quickly was the volunteer would go to a bridge, look over a bridge, both sides, and record whether they saw a fish or not a fish. It was so we knew when there weren't hitch and we knew when there were hitch. And on the basis of that, we were able to tell uh, what was happening in streams throughout all around Clear Lake. And what I can tell you is that the, the, the numbers were um, ranked in terms of, of streams with the most hitch. Adobe, Adobe uh, Creek always had hitch. Of all of the streams around uh, big, uh, Clear Lake, Adobe Creek has always, always had hitch. Kelsey Creek was next, and then it came on down. And it was really unique because Adobe Creek is unique. It's not like any other creek. And as I'll come in a few minutes, it's, uh, 
it's not a good creek to use as a template for every other creek around Clear Lake. And the reason is because there are two reservoirs upstream. No other creek has reservoirs. And the behavior of Adobe Creek is different from any other stream. Um, going on very quickly, I was a contributor to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Conservation Strategy and a um, member of the Big uh, Valley Groundwater Sustainability Plan. Um, so, um, before last year, for the, for the year of the time that the plan was being developed. Um, of course, conditions affecting survival in Clear Lake introduce non native species. The silver sides and the threadfin shad compete for food. Largemouth bath, bass presentation and disruption of spawning runs. That's not talked about too much, but when the hitch, because bass attack, and I invite you to look at, a, look at um, uh, uh, YouTubes of bass attacking prey, the underwater, and it's ferocious. It's just ferocious. And so they are, they're attacking schools of hitch when they're coming in and disrupting them from coming into the creeks. The other big fact that's about them that's not on this, well, survival. Physical barriers, and I'm focusing now on Kelsey Creek. Physical barriers to the spawning grounds. There are two on Kelsey Creek. One is the detention structure, which is um, downstream from Kelseyville, a mile and a half, and then the footings on the Main Street Bridge that are an absolute barrier to hitch going upstream and cuts off about over eight miles of spawning area. The degradation of the spawning beds, the gravel beds that you've seen have been degraded in all streams because of gravel mining. There are fewer fish entering those streams every, not every year, but as we've seen on, on uh, Fred's slides, the numbers are going down coming into the streams. The real question is, overall, is what's happening in the lake. So the question then becomes, could we go to our next slide and we'll see. This is the big question that I sought to and seek to address in this paper, as well as some comments about Adobe Creek. The question is, does groundwater pumping for frost protection in Big Valley reduce stream flow in Kelsey Creek during the hitch spawning runs? That's the proposition that's being made, and you just heard that proposition, is that groundwater pumping for frost protection reduces stream flows and hence harms the hitch. Next slide, please. This is um, looking at an aerial view of, of uh, Big Valley, and I had to point out these little, little uh, orange. The blue line is, of course, Kelsey Creek. The yellow line is Highway 29, where it crosses uh, Kelsey Creek. That's Kelseyville, the town of Kelseyville right there. At that, um, starting at the very bottom, there's a gauge maintained by the U.S. Geological Survey of the stream flows in Kelsey Creek. It's been maintained at, at that location since 1947, and all those records are available. The next one, uh, a little orange one, kind of squiggly th line is where, is one of our two farms, and that's where I live there on Kelsey Creek. It's just a, and we've been there in, since 1976. My wife have owned that spot, and I've watched fish. Can't get any hitch, because they won't, can't get up there right now. Going up to just above where the next, where the blue line cross, crosses the yellow. In other words, Kelsey Creek goes over, goes um, under uh, Highway 29. The next one up is the uh, um, Main Street Bridge that bars Hitch from coming up anywhere heading s south, which would be down from there. Next, um, I'm sorry, it's back. Uh, that one is our other farm, uh, which has the 10-acre vineyard on it and goes right on Kelsey Creek. Up above that is uh, the detention structure, which is at the end of the gravel section. And then the last one is the gauge maintained by the California Department of Water Resources. So those two gauges are really important because you can tell how much water is coming 
into Big Valley, and then how much of it is down at the Big Valley. So in other words, and the proposition is, well, if there's groundwater pumping going on in Big Valley, such as that it would lower the uh, flows in Big Valley and streams, the gauge down below should reflect less water than the gauge up above in general. That's it. It doesn't. And that was checked out by the engineers on the Big Valley Groundwater Sustainability Basin, and they found no evidence that water in Big Valley was being reduced, in uh, Kelsey Creek was being reduced by groundwater pumping. So, um, notwithstanding folks saying that that's not the same, not the case. We're, uh, we pump water uh, for frost protection and overhead sprinklers. We have a pump that's 600 feet from the creek and a reservoir that's 1,200 feet from the creek. That pump is a 20 horsepower pump, and it runs these overhead sprinklers and from a 180 foot deep well. We irrigate with a drip system, which uses a very small amount of water relative to frost protection. We have a pipeline that runs from that well, by the way, 600 feet from the creek to the creek. It's available for pumping back into the creek. We will do that if it appears to be a contribution to the hitch flows. We're, we're here to do that. Now, the... Excuse me here for just a second. Keep following my notes. Frost protection... Could you maybe go to our next, please, slide? Let me see where you are. Okay, this is... These are the frost protection base, uh, basics. And by the way, Sarah's slide about when frost protection occurs is not correct. It is not correct. And we've been frost protecting for 50 years. So I have some experience with this. Frost protection starts at the earliest, and we're talking about vineyards, and also their pear orchards too, but at the very earliest at the very end of March. Now, hitch run in March and can start running at the end of February, which means that for that entire period of time, there is no pumping going on at all. To the so in terms of that portion of the spawning. It, uh, frost protection can run up into May. It's not very much of it, but some. Irrigation starts typically around the first end of May, first of June, and goes in through the summer with a few irrigations after the harvest in October. Uh, frost protection is essential for the production of pears and wine grapes in Big Valley. The water is applied to crops at night and early morning when temperatures likely to fall below 32 degrees. Um, you cannot raise wine grapes or pears in Big Valley without frost protection. Absolutely no way. Without that frost protection, the whole, it, there are no wine grapes. There are no uh, pears being produced, is the long and short. Water is applied between from four to 10 hours um, in a night, depending on the temperature. If the temperature is slightly below, around 32 degrees later in the night, why well, then you'll be pumping for a shorter period of time. The number of nights in a season that are, the groundwater pumping occurs, and this is in all of Big Valley, by the way, it's not just Kelsey Creek, typically range um, from some nights, some seasons, there is no groundwater pumping. You'll see one here where there was one night in the entire season um, to uh, ranges from zero to 12 with an average pumping each night um, of, with an average of nights pumped being six nights. Groundwater is the principal source of the water with some near stream pumping and then reservoirs supplement the groundwater and that's what we have. We have pump and we fill the reservoir for six hours it takes to do that, and typically we're frost protecting six hours, so that's a total of 12 hours in a day. Next slide, please. Uh, what we do here is a comparison of the USGS and KCK, that's uh, Kelsey Creek, I don't know what the other K stands for, but it, uh, it's a 
State Department of Water Resources designation for that lower gauge. And these slides are for the years 2011, 2018, 2019, and 2020 for Kelsey Creek. The, and those are the dates that Hitch ran each year. The dates the frost protection pumping occurred and a comparison of the two stream, uh, stream flow gauges to ascertain whether the stream flow was affected by pumping for frost protection. Those are the slides we're going to see in a minute. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is the spring of 2011. I'll explain in a minute why I chose 20. Well, I did 2011 because my, our dear friend Don Newtoner, who's since passed away, farmed pears downstream from us for 70 years. And a fine man and I, his, his widow, Margaret, I called her and I said, I'd like to get some data on when frost protection occurred that Don had those records. So this is what she sent me. USGS gauge um, height. Now this is way upstream. Okay, this is the gauge. And you see the bouncing lines. That's rainfall events that are coming. And then the stream flow events coming down and there's a little blip where there was a little water came in and then a bigger one. This is the downstream gauge. As you will note, those two gauges parallel each, each other virtually precisely. Now, hitch ran, and when I say a hitch ran, meaning that adult hitch came to the base of the detention structure, which a number of us saw today, and were blocked there. And that structure, by the way, is one that you all manage. You may not know it, but it's, it's under your jurisdiction. So Hitch came on six days. Now, that's, when I say six days, that's not continuous days. It means that they were seen on those days between March 31st and April 5th. Actually, that is six continuous days. We did see them constantly for those six days. And then not after that. Okay, here are the night's frost protect, protection. And in this case, Don did frost protection for 12 nights between April 8th and May 5th. And as you can tell, April 8th to May 5th is more than 12 days. It's, what is it, it's, uh, 27 days. So it meant that frost, which is the case, it's not a solid, frost events are scattered out, typically, although they can be some extended. Okay, next slide please. Oh, point being, the theory would be, the proposition would be that um, frost protecting for 12 nights should be, ref if, if it's making a difference in the stream flow, should be reflected on the graph. In other words, that the lower graph should be dipping down uh, to show that there had been enough water taken out of the creek, if you will of enough to affect that flow, that flow that the hitch are relying on. If we can go to the next slide. This is 2018, spring of 2018. Uh, same thing, in other words, the two gauges, the upper gauge, the lower gauge are matching each other precisely and because they're measuring the, actually in this case, they're measuring the gauge height. In other words, it's going up and down based on the uh, amount of water that there is. Go down to Hitch Observed. We saw Hitch from, for four days, and that's the entire season. I mean, this is not good, really not good, but that's the fact that they were there for four days, March 28th to Mar April 1st. The frost protection nights, we did four nights of frost protecting. First one was April 17th to the 19th. That was three, three in rows, and then on April 30th. Four nights, the whole season. All those took place after the hitch had been there and, and, uh, and left. And this particular frost protection was all upstream of where the hitch were, by the way. But it all took place after the hitch had been there. Now, let's go to the... Next can, I, can I interrupt yes, for please. a second before you yeah. move on? Can you, it's hard for me to see. I can see the graph on top with yes. the, uh, 
measurements on the left hand side and the dates uh, the boxes don't match can you describe what the uh, measurements are on the bottom graph it's the same they're the same dates I, I, it's just very difficult to read um, but it's over it's the fe it's a month at a time Fe february 1st to march 1st and it, it's hard to see on those because they have those vertical lines i'm sorry about that but those are li those are uh lining up is it every 15 days uh let's see those vertical yeah, that and let's see one i think so I, yes i think that is uh, frankly i can't tell because i can't see it let me see here. And then on just on a the, minute. Let me see if I can. And then on the vertical, is it um, like by age? Is, is it by two points? <laughs> Pardon me. I, I just wanted to under, better understand. Oh, on the, the top, of the five, of the um, the one on the top is by feet. In other words, it's how how high is the water in the it's and, and the one on the bottom, is, the KCK, is, the, is every two feet. Uh, the lines. Yeah, I can't. Let's see. Yeah, and I think that's correct. And of course, the basis, these gauges don't match in terms of where, they, where zero is, if you will, because they just are set in the stream. That, of course, however they are, but it's showing how the relative positions are. How they go up, go up and down, basically, is what is happening. 28, are we four days, 2018? Is that... I don't know if that answers your question. So no, that, that, that is good. I don't believe that uh, if you can send us um, your presentation oh. so I can get a better okay. look at it, it's hard to tell from right here. I'd be happy Isn't to do that. Um, I don't remember seeing this specific one. I, maybe I went through all the charts and okay. I'm just not seeing the comparable. He said he had a new one. I have. Let's see, I'm not sure. Was there an I see USGS, I see CDFW, FGC. You can see, of course, comparing the slopes on each of them, they correspond. There's a, there's a, a attachment to the agenda for the uh, Ag Advisory. Uh, comments. Uh, some oh, of these graphs appear in there, oh, so that's right. those that, may be a little more legible. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we will be able to go back and uh, look yeah. at those a little more detailed. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to uh, spring of 2019, please. And the next slide. Spring of 2019. Same thing, basically. But here's what's important. In the hitch run in 2019, there were 12 days, meaning 12 days in which Hitch were at that location beginning in April th 3 to 4, uh, and then 7 to 11, and 18 to 24. And the, we frost protected one night that entire season, just one night. Spring of 2020, if you can go to that one real quickly. Next slide. Um, on 2020, same thing, you see the patterns. The hitch observed April 13th to April 18th for five nights. The frost protection, uh, semicolon frost and the run overlap. Uh, the first hitch sighting is March 31st. The next one, 414, is the next sighting. And then eight, uh, May 5th, uh, May 3rd to the 5th is four nights where there was frost protection going on. So if we go to the next, and by the again, you see the, path, the comparison of the two gauges. I don't belabor this thing, but next, next, uh, okay. This is um, an important calculation that I did to see if it, what it tells me. Is the question is frost protection as a percent of the spawning season. In other words, how much frost protection pumping is going on in that season. So I used as a spawning season is February 15th to May 15th. Now, of course, in our example, they're not doing that, but that was what they ought to be in terms of that whole period of time. 
And that's 90 days, and converted to hours is 2,160 hours. Frost protection events occur on average six nights per season, and groundwater is pumped onto vines for six nights per, per six hours per night, and 36 hours of frost protection pumping per season. In other words, this is the pumping. This is not filling the reservoir. That's the next one. Okay, and then so 36 hours is spent pumping for fro typical frost protection season. A pumping to fill the reservoir is another six hours for each of those days um, if per season. So pumping to fill the reservoir plus pumping to spray water onto the vines is 72 hours of frost protection pumping per season. 72 hours. Now if you calculate that as a percent of the entire spawning season, you divide the hours spent pumping with fr for frost protection, that's 72 hours. By the spawning season hours, which is 2,160, I'll put in an extra zero there, shows that pumping for frost protection takes up less than 5% of the spawning season time. Less than 5%. That's an insufficient time to have any appreciable effect on stream flow. Now, if we can go to the next slide, please. My conclusion that I came to on this was for the years 2011, 2018, and 2019, groundwater pumping occurred after the run, hitch runs completed. And let me qualify that somewhat because there could be more time in order to have the fry go through their growth cycle and leave. So that's, it may be a bit longer than that. For the year 2020 hitch spawning run, and groundwater pumping overlapped. Groundwater pumping occurred less during less than 5% of the hitch spawning season, and groundwater pumping for frost protection in Big Valley does not reduce stream flow in Kelsey Creek during the hitch spawning runs. Those were my conclusions from that data. Next slide, please. Okay. And this, just to show you that very quickly, this is from Kelseyville. That's an improvement on the earlier slide. You see Kelseyville, Main Street Bridge, that's an absolute block to hitch going upstream. Gravel pits, the going vertically is where gravel mining took place. My vineyard is right there. You see Windrum Vineyard. Detention structure is down at the north end of the gravel. And then further out, the KCK gauge is the Department of Water Resources gauge. Can we go to the next slide, please? That gravel, by the way, is the is a most suitable spawning ground on Kelsey Creek right now, and not nearly enough hitch can get there. Uh, let's see. Uh, anyway, this is going south of Kelseyville. This is not scaled quite right. That Main Street Bridge, and you get down to the USGS gate, or the yeah. Next slide, please. I didn't want to kind of speed along here. Uh, next slide, please. Adobe Creek, um, and Adobe Creek's unique, and I may have to, um, since 2004, Adobe Creek has never failed to have hitch spawning run, unlike the other tributaries to Clear Lake. Every year, Chai Council monitors have observed hitch in Adobe Creek, and the numbers have been substantial. What differentiates Adobe Creek from other streams is the two reservoirs upstream. No other streams have reservoirs. How the reservoirs affect Adobe Creek to make it consistently attractive to hitch is not known. I th let's go to the, I'm not sure there's a, go, next slide. I'm not sure there is one on this one. I, but let me. Peter, this uh, is the, this is the last slide. You okay, have. let me comment then very quickly because I think this is extremely important as relates to Adobe Creek. Let me talk about stranding hitch in Adobe Creek. In all the years we monitored Adobe Creek, it had water in it, more water than any other stream in terms of the consistency in hitch. Suddenly, the, the Adobe Creek started to dry up. Hitch started to get stranded. I saw it for the first time several years ago, and I was shocked because I'd never seen anything like that. Some precipitous event happened then 
to reduce the flows. Something. I went about trying to find that something. And I went, uh, first thing, I assumed that maybe somebody just started pumping, dropped it for the first time, dropped a pipe in and took all that water. Because it isn't very much water, um, as I'll get back to in a sec. So I uh, looked at the, the, US, the uh, county's website to see if I could identify pumping stations or something of that sort. And I, I couldn't. There was a big reservoir, not close, a ways back. And I asked one of my friends here, uh, David, do you know, because he's familiar with the vineyard, you know if they've been pumping from the creek from that vineyard? Well, the pump wasn't on the, the creek. It was some, some place back. But something precipitously happened. And I went, by the way, to all of the looking spaces on the places on the creek to see if I could see anything that would account for it. There is an answer somewhere, but I don't know what it is yet. There's some, some, something going on on that creek at some point that slowed down those flows. The, my hearing the testimony today, well, first of all, so how do you do it? How do you save those people, those hitch? Everybody's talked about it, you know. You get some water out of Holland Springs Reservoir. That's what you do. Problem on Highland Springs Reservoir is that the outlet gate, gate is frozen up. You can't open it. So, and this is where you ask a farmer. My premise is here, farmers, agriculture has got to be part of this discussion. They've been excluded deliberately. All of, I would say, I don't want to cast this word, but they have not been asked to participate in any of these uh, discussions going on but between the tribes and the governmental agencies or anybody else. And we're the folks who know, because we're there, just like I demonstrated to you about pumping from, Big Valley, from Kelsey Creek. What can I tell you about listening to the testimony of Dobie Creek? It's so different from all the other creeks, it's not, you can't extrapolate entirely. But listen to this. First of all, how do you get water out of Dobie Creek, out of the Holland Springs Dam? It's simple. You walk out there, you get uh, rain for rent, who I could call tomorrow. You call tomorrow. It's a company in, out in Woodland that create, has pumps for agricultural pumping um, to uh, pumping water out of canals, for example, into ditches for farming, all kinds of that sort of stuff. They could pump water. They'd be here in a week with one of their reps to come look at this situation. They'd ask you, how much water do you need? And they would put a pump in right next to the, and we were down there yesterday, right next to the reservoir, run a pipe through the spillway and drop water into the creek. I learned today that the amount of water that it takes is 34 CFS, cubic feet per second. That is 225 gallons a minute. That, you can produce 225 gallons a minute with a 20, a 20 horsepower pump. Actually, it'll produce more than that. So the thing that floors me is hearing this, why in the world didn't you put a pump in this creek right then and save all these hitch? Every year, could do it until that thing gets fixed. That's a farmer's perspective. Why is that? So anyway, so where do we then go? I guess I see, so, so what? Then these other facts, and folks can, maybe I construe them differently from other people, or no, incorrectly, let's put it this way. <laughs> I'm not saying it's good. But a female hitch, everything I'm reading in the literature, carries an average of 36,000 eggs. That means that for a 1,000 hitch, that's 36 million eggs for a 1,000 hitch. First thing it tells me, I think from college biology, is, well, that means that there's a high mortality rate in, in eggs. That's why you have so many. But that's still a tremendous number of eggs. Now, if you get a year, like you've had all these dry years, and so and the hitch numbers are dropping, this year we'll have a tremendous amount of rain and it flows in these streams. They ought to be working just fine. Peter, um, yeah. so, we, we've got to move this I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay. Uh, that's the end of it. Uh, let me say one concluding thing. Hitch are losing their war in Clear Lake. They're starved by silver sides and threadfin shad. And they're consumed by bass. I'm sorry. 
Agriculture has to be included in all of these discussions. All of them, but with all of them. And ag, I submit, has been wrongfully blamed for the decline of hitch and its authority, and that's the essence of it. We all need farmers in every one of these meetings in order to have the data and the information. You don't see in any of these documents, I mean, agriculture essentially has been excluded. We need to be at the table so that you all can consider what the facts are that we can bring. I apologize, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you, Peter. We are gonna go ahead and move on over to the Ag Advisory Committee. We pull up oh, yeah. the slides. I believe we have Sharon who is joining us in the chambers. Uh, good afternoon. So we have two people from uh, to speak to, uh, to you from the Ag, Ag Advisory Committee. So, David, you want to come up too? So, well, let me start here. Uh, we have some slides that are accompanying slides to what Peter has shared with you. I'm going to be presented by uh, Dr. Brock Zoller, so I'll ask him to come up. Does he need to go up there? You 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 can come up here if that's what you'd like. Okay. I just want to let everybody know we have a, a hard stop at 4 p.m. We have to take a break. Um, so we'll go for the next 15 minutes or so, and then we'll, we'll have to stop whatever we're doing right at that time and then come back. I think we can do that. Okay, okay so for uh, let me introduce uh, myself. I'm Sharon Zoller. I'm the chairperson for the uh, Lake County Agricultural Advisor Committee that was um, um, blessed by the Board of Supervisors about three years ago. And thank you, Jessica, for bringing us that forward. Uh, the members of the committee besides myself are David Weiss, uh, R Randy Craig, Bruce Merrilies, Pat Scully, Alicia Russell, and non-voting members on the committee, Jessica Piska, Michael Green, and Catherine... <coughs> Vanderwall. So that that's the committee. So today we have uh, some data to present and uh, also a speaker, um, uh, David Weiss, and then I will sum up uh, quickly uh, the recommendation from the committee. I have just a few slides. I need to talk to the microphone very closely in order for you to hear me. So I'm going to take this off and uh, I also need to be able to point to the data. So I think I can do it with this particular old-fashioned device right here, since I have a I have a red uh, I have a red uh, light thing that uh, gets absorbed by the by the file there and the screen, and I can't use it. But I put together a lot of data here, and the idea is I like to see what uh, I'm talking about here in order to understand all of the history of the, the counts that have been made and the history of rainfall and environment and things like that. And I like to put it all on the same screen so you can do comparisons with it. So what I've got here, sure. What I've got here is all of the people that have done observations of the hitch. That would be fishermen, incidental capture. They had to report how many hitch were in their catches and uh, their particular data is going to be on the next slide because uh, there's quite a few more fish in order to accommodate their data. I have to shrink down looking at the other data. So we have a different scale, so it'll be on the next one. But that's one of the observational ones, 1961 to 2001. Uh, moving on up, uh, the Clear Lake uh, Veteran, uh, excuse me, Vector Control District SANE data, 1987 to 2010, that was done. That's this data down here in the dark blue line here. And the other thing, the other information that's on here in addition to the years and the rainfall is, is a regression analysis of the data. So in order to do that, uh, you can get that online and uh, you submit the data in there. And there's a straight line to describe all of these things going up and down here. As a matter of fact, it's not particularly significant because the R squared value is pretty low. But nevertheless, it's a straight line. That's mean, that means there's no shrinking of the data that they, when, when they were measuring the, in their SANE nets, there was no shrinking of the population of hitch, according to the observations they made. 
even though you look at it, there were a number of years that were low here, they came back again. And so the line itself indicates that there's nothing was happening to the population. Moving on over to Chai Council visuals, uh, their data is down here and it's 2005 to 2013. And that's this data right down here. And you can see they finished up pretty low here. Uh, I, but the interesting thing was the, the same data from the vector control district exactly matched them on these particular years that they overlapped. So I was encouraged by that. We don't really have a lot of overlap. We have some, when I put in the fisherman data, you'll see. Uh, we don't have overlap with the uh, Fish, and, Fish and Wildlife Agency, which is the next group here. Uh, they did it from in 2014. They skipped 2015, but then did 2016 to 22. So if you looked at, uh, if you looked at a regression analysis of those two data, the Chai Council and the, and the California Fish and Wildlife, uh, that, that indicates that they are also not diminishing. In fact, that line says they go up. Anyway, I put that on there. And of course, the rainfall is the other thing that I was very interested in. I want to point out, uh, I was uh, alive and well and farming up here in 1976-77, which was a tough drought when the, when the rainfall went down below 10 inches uh, per season in Kelseyville. And this is the rainfall year, September 1 to August 31. And it's, it's reached that level again here. And when I put the fishermen's data on there, you see that they didn't catch any fish, any hitch during that time either. And so what, what you're seeing is on these two low lines here of the California Fish and Wildlife, we're into this extremely low uh, rainfall data year. And so that's happened before. That's been one of the low things. But as you can see, there's other reasons why they're low. And of course, that's been talked about by many people, you know, the other competitive factors out in the lake, you know, the, the silver sides that we put out there to take care of the gnats and they, they're competing for food with a hitch. Uh, there's, uh, there's also the bass that are eating the hitch and so and other competitive fish out there, as well as some predatory birds, which I'll show you a picture of in the next slide. So that's the data there. And I'll move over to the next slide if I can. If anybody's listening to change it, aha. Okay, I said I had to shrink it down, so here's the rainfall data, it got shrunk here. There's the 50 inches, which was the maximum down here, and it was to accommodate the, the catch from the, the fishermen, which was much higher numbers, which forces down everything else because they're dealing with lower levels in their observations. Nevertheless, it shows you what's there, and if you did a regression analysis, that's this line. It really was not decreasing during this particular time frame. Uh, there were highs and lows, of course, and even it finished up here very low, extremely low, for the last four or five years, it looks like. But if I could point out 76, 77, 76 has a zero here for the catch, which goes up that far. It recovered, and they were catching them again. 77, they actually did not do any fishing at, during that year. Maybe they couldn't even get their boats out, so there's actually no data for 77. That's one of the reasons it's down there. Moving on up here to where we are right now, extremely low rainfall year. Uh, you can see where we are with uh, fish and wildlife. And uh, anyway, their, their, their um, analysis shows that, uh, they, here, here's the results right here. There actually is a diminishing of the hitch population at that time as there was for the hitch. But you can see the rainfall has started to come back up. This is 2023, which is only partial year at this point. We're going to get probably may, maybe even as much as we've got already. So it's going to be up above the average line. And I expect from previous behavior that probably the hitch population is going to go up. We don't know if it'll do it the first year, because as we talked about, there's other things that affect the population. But nevertheless, uh, it looks to me like the normal situation, it has ups and downs in the population. And of course, these are not as big of populations as the Indies experienced, or even I saw when I first moved up here in the 70s and 80s, I saw some pretty big hitch populations spawning in, in Kelsey Creek. But as been pointed out, we have a detention structure out there, which people talked about at the time, and they put a fish ladder in it, but it doesn't function as well as they thought, and somebody needs to be maintaining that a little better so that the more fish can get above the detention structure, spawn around Dorn Crossing up to the current bridge across highway, the highway into Kelseyville. 
And that we've talked about a long time because that, uh, that is a clear obstacle that the hitch don't get by. We live up Kelsey Creek another mile further and we've never seen hitch there. And we're back looking at the creek every day, really. So there, it's a complete barrier. And if you go look at it, you can see why. There's no way for very many fish to be able to get up there. So that needs to be worked on. And that would expand the, rate, the area where the hitch could spawn. Uh, very simply, really. So why aren't we doing that? Those two structures working on those fish ladders. Next slide. We talked about one of the things I, ha I and my wife have to be going across the lake with some other people that had a boat in 2013, in, in October actually, and these were pelicans that were in the mouth of, near the mouth of Kelsey Creek. And I don't spend a lot of time on the lake, and I, but I have seen pelicans across the lake sometimes, not nearly so many, and I've seen them flying over. They're beautiful, but you don't see them all the time. But there were incredible numbers that particular year. And each one of those pelicans eats two to four pounds of fish per day per bird. So just imagine what they are eating there. So those are things that uh, other reasons why fish populations in general are diminished, really, that uh, doesn't really have anything to do with groundwater pumping. Uh, next slide. This is the last slide. Like I say, I like to see, and uh, we have dates going back to 23, so here's 100, yards, here's 100 years of full bloom dates in the pear industry here. And uh, as was talked about, uh, we normally don't have to protect pears before full bloom, although that can vary a little bit. If it got really cold, sometimes we would protect some tissue ahead of that. But basically, full bloom is used the time to start the frost season, and when they start to look like pears, we really have to be concerned about them. So... Frost season kind of in most years begins about full bloom. Full bloom here is zero, which is, which is uh, March 15th. And the average date is April 5th for full bloom. So things that are occurring below March 15th, we're, we're basically not doing any pumping for. So I just wanted to point that out. And the hitch spawning season starts before that. We're not really doing any pumping. And so really the amounts of water that we're doing out of our pumps you know, for frost are pretty minimal. The Kelseyville pear industry, when I first moved up to Kelseyville, in all of Lake County, there were 5,000 acres of pears. Now there are 1,500 acres. So we're, we're not pumping as much as we used to, or we, we're, we're capable of doing then. Actually, we didn't have as many frost control systems by water in those days, but we moved into it. But there's not as many pears. Uh, there are more grapes, but the grapes come out a little later, and so presumably they're going to be uh, not using quite as much. As far as the valley's concerned, they more or less have to deal with the same events, uh, minus maybe one or two a year because they come out later. Uh, there's 10,000 acres of pears in Lake County, but a lot of those <coughs> are on the slopes, and some of them aren't really on tributaries leading into Clear Lake. So, And they also are in warmer areas, and they don't even have frost control systems, many of them. So... Uh, I think this business about attacking farmers for what they pump as, as a solution to the problem is, is in error, really, that we need to look at things that could be fixed quite easily and real reasons for this. Uh, I don't know that, that we're ever going to see this population come back because of the competitive factors that have showed up in the lake, but I think we're going to see it bounce back to what is currently normal for these, this day and age. So that's the end of my talk. Okay. Thank you. So do, you, so do you think you're David, about five minutes, David, or do you want it longer? Shorter. Okay. Try to. <laughs> I'm a farmer. I'd rather farm than talk. But thank you for having us. Um, I, so I'm David Weiss, and I I'm I'm, uh, own Bella Vista Farming Company. We farm grapes and pears uh, throughout the Big Valley area and other parts of Lake County, but entirely within Lake County. So we've been here for 30 years, and um, which is a, you know, a far cry from um, the Windrums, uh, let alone the Native American population that's here and has been here for thousands of years. So I have a very small um, perspective, but I think it's valuable. Um, my concentration is about the, the uh, proposition that groundwater pumping is affecting stream flows, and I disagree. And I want to remind the board 
that um, we just spent a huge amount of time and money preparing the groundwater sustainability plan. I was part of that group that uh, advised the board on that. And <clears throat> what um, there are th that report, if you haven't read it, is is replete with many instances uh, citing the uh, inadequate data, um, but general conclusions that groundwater pumping is not affecting stream flow. Um, I want to just talk for a minute about <coughs> frost protection. Frost protection is limited and intermittent. It's not consistent, it's not constant. It changes year to year, week to week. Um, it happens a few hours at a time, as Peter's discussed, on a few nights each year, and it totals less than 5% of the total spawning season. Um, the impact on stream flows due to groundwater pumping is negligible. In that GSPAC or the uh, groundwater sustainability plan, here are quotes that I've written down, a few just for um, to illustrate the point. No significant correlation was identified between surface water depletion and groundwater elevation measurements. The magnitude of depletion relative to the measured stream flow is negligible. Based on currently available data, the effects of depletion seem to be small relative to available flow in the stream. Modeling, there's a, there's a model that was developed as part of the whole uh, groundwater sustainability plan. Modeling results show that frost protection pumping has no measurable effect on depletions of surface water flows. In addition, when comparing the downstream to the upstream spring flows on Kelsey Creek for the period 2013 to 2020, there are no apparent differences that would indicate sudden surface water reduction indicative of frost protection events. The current evidence shows that the pattern of historical depletions has remained relatively stable over the past 30 years. However, the Clear Lake Hitch population counts as reported by USGS and many others have been declining without question over the last few years. Therefore, available evidence does not, is not sufficient to establish a clear connection between groundwater depletions and the decline of the Clear Lake Hitch. So as all of this is being discussed and considered, the idea of putting through a curtailment on groundwater pumping for frost protection is preposterous. It's not going to help. Um, one thing, if, if, if that happens, if there is a curtailment put in place, it's very unclear that it'll have any impact on the stream flow. It's very unlikely to, to save the hitch because of that. But what is clear and certain is that crops will be affected. There will be crop loss as a result of not being able to frost protect. And the other thing that I've looked into just recently as a result of all this is that our crop insurance coverage will not cover a, a loss that's a result of a government policy. So if there's a curtailment order placed, we're basically, you know, without coverage at all. So um, I just want to make those points, and uh, I certainly echo the comments that Peter made and uh, the ones that Brock has made. Um, and. Uh, would be glad to answer questions if, if appropriate. I made it. 401. Yep. Okay. So, do we have to stop now? Do I have three minutes to wrap up, or do you want me to do it afterwards? Three minutes? <coughs> no, no pressure. Okay, so uh, just to, uh, you know, Put, put, a, put a bow on from the Lake County Agriculture Advisory Committee. We are recommending that, um, that there's a no vote on the, 
urgency. Uh, in the letter that I sent you, we had several things that needed we thought needed to be addressed, one of which was uh, looking at the uh, all the tributaries, which has been discussed earlier, uh, and, and their uniqueness and what needs can happen there. I looked through uh, a number, I found a number of reports starting as early as 2009, really extensive reports about the hitch. This, this is not a new conversation by any means, um, and I didn't go back to the last century, I thought I'd start in the 21st century. Uh, one in 2009, a fabulous report uh, put together by Robinson Rancheria Environmental Center uh, talking to about the habitat restoration and the predators. Another one that was done by um, the um, Biological Diversity, a Center for Biological Diversity that spoke a lot about uh, barriers and um, their, their last sentence was um, remediation of barriers require coordination with fish and wildlife services, California Department of Fish and Game, the tribes, tribal organizations, Caltrans and Lake County and private landowners. As been said before in a lot of these conversations that have already happened, ag was not invited to be at the table. So certainly in conversations going forward, we wanna be part of the solution of having this conversation. In the last uh, report that I found that was very extensive, 378 pages, uh, that was put together um, by the uh, Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife, in that report, four times there was a list of excuse me, 14 bullet points of things that can be done, should be done right away to, to help support the hitch sli um, survival. And with that was a very extensive evaluation of 10 of the tributaries, what needed to happen. This was in 2014. So a question is, a wonderment is, why is this still a list? and that it hasn't been implemented. Um, and then one thing I found in my Googling uh, wizardry was that from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, there's a fisheries restoration grant. I found that 25 uh, projects were granted this year. <coughs> Lake County was not one of them. So I challenge the Fish and Wildlife if Lake County is important, and I think that it is, and I think that the life of the hitch is important. Let's see and put some money behind it. Um, so just to sum up that um, our recommendation is that there's a no vote for the county proclamation at this time. We, the Lake County Agricultural Community, welcome the opportunity to partner with the county, state agencies, the tribal representatives to co create an equitable solution to the and with the active participation of all the stock stakeholders to help make sure that the hitch survive. Thank you. Okay, thank you. It's 4.05. Uh, how long? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Five minutes. Okay, we'll take a five minute break. We'll come back at 4.10. It's okay. All right. We're at 414. We're coming back from our, our break. If everyone could please have a seat. We can get started again. I want to remind our presenters that we're going to try and stick to the 10 minutes so that we can um, get through this material. I know we had two longer presenters, so um, any of the early presenters, if you have more to add during public comment, um, feel free to come up during that time and add if there's um, information that you wanted to go a little deeper into. Okay, Marina, who's our next presenter? Yes, hello, I'm gonna um, share my screen again so folks can see. Um, I believe we have Eric Sklar, uh, the chair of our Blue Ribbon Commission for the Rehabilitation of Clear Lake. I believe he is in the oh, room, Oh wait, we, Marina, we have, are you from the water board? We have the state water board already sitting up here. Okay, perfect, then in scratch place. that. We are gonna go um, with Jessica Bean, environmental program director for the state Water Resources Control Board, and I believe she is also joined by a colleague, 
Um, so feel free to do proper introductions while I throw up your presentation. Yes, my name is Jessica Bean. I am with the State Water Resources Control Board and I have with me my colleague, um, John Murphy, who's also with the State Water Board. And Marina, you can just jump to the second slide. Thank you so much. So just a really quick introduction to the California Water Boards. There's one state water board and nine regional water boards. Um, we are regulatory agencies. We protect water quality. Uh, we regulate drinking water. We administer water rights and we provide financial and technical assistance uh, throughout the state. Next slide, please. In terms of the California Water Board's work in Lake County thus far, it's primarily been focused on by our Central Valley uh, Water Quality Control Board, which is the gray um, area, Region 5 right there, covers a pretty substantial area. And their work has uh, been on total maximum daily loads, TMDLs, irrigated lands program, and waste discharge requirements. And they are also participating in the blue ribbon panel. So what we are here for today is really leaning on the water rights component that we do administer water rights in the state for surface water. And that has to do with managing flows. Um, when we administer water rights, we do have to take into consideration uh, balancing of beneficial uses, including public trust needs, which includes flows for fish. And so we're here today protecting the hitch. Um, we're hearing that everyone here today is interested in protecting the hitch, even though there may be some differences of opinions on why we're here or how to do that. And uh, really, we need everybody's help. That's that coordination we've heard so much about. Next slide, please. So um, we have received a lot of data so far. We're looking for more data. We've been analyzing it. Uh, we were also alerted to this issue in early December, so it's very um, fast and moving quickly. We are hearing that um, there are a variety of creeks with different issues, but what we're gonna focus on for our immediate efforts from the water board's excuse me, perspective are these five creeks of interest, which is Kelsey, Adobe, Manning, Cole, and Middle. Next slide, please. And you've seen this slide a bit earlier, but um, really one of the things that we do at the State Water Board is we collect annual water use reporting data. And this is the 2021 reported data for the Clear Lake area. And what you're seeing is um, the green dots, the size of the dot in, um, is a larger diversion. And as you can see, they're definitely along the variety of creeks. Um, there's a variety of uses as well that are reported to us. So if you're looking at some of the blue dots, are being reported as frost protection, um, irrigation and frost protection, and also stock watering. The green is just for general irrigation. And again, this is annual water use reporting for surface water diversions. Next slide, please. Um, when you look at those diversions and we break this down into um, how people are reporting, we're seeing um, the red circles indicate that in the reports, we're being specifically told that they're using the water for frost protection. And then in the, uh, the yellow uh, circles is indicating spring irrigation. So that could be frost protection, that could be spring irrigation. It's not specific to us. Um, we don't quite know. So this is the general data that we're looking at. And I do wanna preface that one of the issues we have with reported data is that we don't have a high frequency of the data being reported. It is, an, it is a big gap for us. So we can't tell you a lot of information and details about this. It's only what's reported to us after we have gone through it. Um, next slide, please. So this is some primarily, excuse me, primary land use data that we have pulled together uh, through our analysis. And as you can see, the purple color indicates vineyards, which is the predominant um, uh, excuse me, crop. And then you have your fruits and nuts, uh, which are in the red color. And then the gray area would be urban use. And then obviously we have other uses in the area too, but I think the, you know, the purple and red jump out at us as well as the gray. Um, next slide, please. And so I jump here to data needs and other questions because I just really quickly went through our slides on that. And we are having a listening session on February 1st where we'll go into greater detail about these this pieces of data that I'm showing you. 
Um, but really, we just have a lot of questions, and a lot of that does revolve around groundwater. We regulate surface water, and so we have some data on that. Um, however, we do need more. But in addition to that, we do not have a lot of um, groundwater data at an adequate scale that we can make determinations on. We need to be able to um, look at information on a specific level and um, sometimes aggregated data that we're seeing in maybe groundwater sustainability plans doesn't allow us to do an independent verification of these things. And for us to make a determination as a re regulatory agency, we need to be able to have good high quality data to make decisions and have them be um, enforceable. So we're looking for things like diversion volumes and timing rates. We do want to know about groundwater surface water interactions, both how to identify those and measure those. Um, we can get some of that through knowing where well locations are, um, obtaining well log logs, depths to screens, the size pumping rates, pumping tests, this kind of information. Um, we're also looking for groundwater quality. You heard uh, it mentioned the potential for an immediate action could be to pump water from a groundwater well and put it into the stream, which seems a little bit backwards if you're thinking about if groundwater, if groundwater is the issue, then if you're pumping into the stream, you're taking water out. But for an immediate need to get just enough to get the fish down, that could be an option. Um, we are hearing that there may be groundwater quality issues that could prevent that. Um, and so we are looking for groundwater quality. And so we're looking for folks who would be interested in sharing any water quality information they've collected to us. Um, we're also uh, looking up on needs for more flow gauges. We want to know about the temperature, timing of frost protection actions. What are the resources we can look at, again, to independently verify the information that we're hearing because there, is, um, there are different points of view and different um, conclusions that folks are coming to right now. So we're also looking for historical records or logs of fish kills and fish rescues. Again, frost protection dates, and then any other information people feel could be valuable. Next slide, please. So from the State Water Board's perspective, we're looking at a two-pronged solution, essentially. Uh, we're looking at immediate uh, things we can do to help the hitch, very you know quick projects, things that can be undertaken quickly, and then long-term actions, because we do recognize this is a longer-term problem that we're not going to be able to fix in a year or two or five even. And so I just mentioned the fact that we need better data to understand the problem and potential solutions. We do plan to do some enforcement in the area. We have an enforcement team at the water boards um, specifically looking at illegal diversions. Um, we've heard that there may be a cannabis component to this for illegal cannabis grows. We have a, um, some enforcement staff specifically looking into cannabis. And we are, from the board's perspective, going to commit resources to come and do enforcement in the area on things like surface water diversions that may be illegal. We're also going to be uh, working with our uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife counterparts to to look at um, some of the areas and things where there may be overlap between enforcement actions. Uh, for this year, we're looking at voluntary actions to keep water in the creeks. Um, I'll go into those a little bit more detail in a moment. Again, collaboration, we really want to get effective solutions and make sure we're getting the messages to all the folks that are out there that need to hear it. And then we are a regulatory action, uh, excuse me, agency, and so if going through voluntary actions and this process doesn't work, um, you know, there may be the need for regulations, and we can talk about what that looks like in a couple more slides. Next slide, please. Again, I, I went through the enforcement component a bit, but I do want to mention a few other things um, in addition to cannabis and diversions. There could be illegal reservoirs and water storage. Um, I mentioned that reporting is a problem. We're, we're seeing issues where we have a lot of um, data we're not getting, and so we'll be looking pretty closely at that. Are there people diverting but not providing that data to us, and can we get them to, um, to give us the data that we need? Again, coordinating with Fish and Wildlife. Next slide. The voluntary actions that we're, we're looking at based on some potential solutions we're hearing from would be, you know, reducing diversions or pumping, again, surface water diversions or groundwater pumping, um, coordinating diversion and pump timing if that is something that, is, uh, that we find is causing the problem, potentially alternate frost protection methods, uh, pump backs, which I've already discussed, and any other ideas that folks have. We, we want to hear about those, bring them to the table. I will say that we're hearing a lot about um, potential stream bed uh, maintenance projects, things like that, that, that may be an option. That is not under our purview, but it's definitely something we'd be interested in coordinating with uh, Fish and Wildlife and other folks on. 
Next slide, please. Again, mentioned this, but going into a little bit more detail, we really would love to see coordinated local solutions if there are folks that are willing to step forward and help us get the data that we need um, or share the messaging. Also, you know, sharing data with neighbors. Sometimes folks just, um, some folks may be talking really well, but others may not, and, and knowing what that is. Um, we also need to help identifying who needs the most help. Uh, we don't know the area as well as you do, and so we want to know, uh, are there smaller farms that maybe could use more support than others, but just identifying some of those hard-to-reach folks. And then um, one thing we have for a long-term question is, is there interest in off-stream storage ponds uh, for some of the folks that are diverting from the stream? And that would be something that we'd <coughs> like to talk to folks about. Next slide. Uh, going into the regulatory component, again, um, in terms of how water rights work in California, uh, folks who want to divert from a surface water stream do need to get a permit, and um, they do not own that water, but they have the right to use that water. And there are other beneficial uses that have to be considered in that. And so uh, we want to make sure that that water is being used beneficially. And so we need good timely information on that. Again, we talked about size of diversions, groundwater use, uh, reporting violations. We do have the Cal EPA reporting portal. If folks believe there is a diversion um, that is illegal, they can report that, it'll come to us and we can investigate it. Again, coordinating with CDFW and long-term frost protection um, is something that we've heard about. These are all um, some of the questions we're asking when we're thinking about what kind of actions could we take. If we don't get the, the data we need to make the decisions, there is the potential for an information order. So that would be a regulatory mechanism that we could use a little bit more quickly to specifically get information about groundwater use and locations and things like that that we don't currently have access to. So ideally we would get that voluntarily, but that is a mechanism we could use if we felt the need to. Um, in addition to long-term frost protection, there are other types of regulatory elements, but to, to be honest, we don't believe we have enough of the information nor the capacity to put one of those into place immediately. So we don't see that happening this year, but it is something that could potentially happen if we're not seeing success in um, uh, voluntary actions next year or maybe the, the year after that. Next slide. Just to remind folks, it is early in the effort, and there are a lot of drivers to this. Um, we've, you know, we're hearing it's complex. There are a lot of variables, so we're certainly not interested in pointing fingers at any one potential issue. The water boards, however, are coming at this from water supply perspective, at least from the state water board, and so that's where a lot of our focus is going to be on. Um, but we do want to find solutions, and we don't want the uncertainty to lead to extinction. So that is something that is extremely important to us. Next slide. Quickly, we've already started this work. We're doing a lot of engagement. We've been meeting with um, some of the re representatives from the tribes, also coordinating with federal, state, and local folks. We have been meeting with county representatives as well, and doing community engagement, working um, to meet with the farmers and um, different agricultural interests in the area. And then we've held some public listening sessions as well. Next slide, please. What we're asking from community members is to commit to specific voluntary actions, consider becoming a local coordinator to help keep up momentum. That local coordinator does not have a definition. We're looking for folks that are just willing to step up and help to make some of these things a reality. Um, we're looking for data sharing and help with answering our questions um, and connecting with hard to reach folks. Um, I'm getting close to the end, but really we'd love to be invited to other meetings where we can have the ability to provide our information to folks, work directly and speak with people so that we can make those connections on a one-to-one -one scale. Next slide. Uh, we did have um, a listening session last week, and then we're here right now, and we do have an upcoming listening session. So if anyone is interested in participating, this information is on our website, but we encourage you to attend. Um, there will be a presentation, but uh, a large opportunity for discussion. Next slide. And what I do want to point out is that we, if you're interested in keeping up to date on what we're doing, you can email us at clearlakehitch at waterboards. .ca.gov, um, or you can sign up for our email update list. We have a sheet right out in front here for anyone who is interested today to just provide your email. We'll sign you up today. There's also a QR code if you want to use your phone to get to our website. And we are done. Thank you.
Um, I have a couple of questions. Absolutely. So with this, um, you know, we've heard from many different stakeholders today, and we've gotten a lot of different, uh, we've got a lot of information. And I, it seems like the, you are going to be sort of the collecting body of all of this. Is that true? Well, I wouldn't say we're the collecting body of all the information, um, but what we are trying to do is be able to um, independently verify what we're seeing. You know, people are showing graphs and charts and they're telling us, you know, here is, here is what we're seeing. And we want to be able to verify that. You know, we need to, it needs to be reproducible so that we can see those same things. It, you know, again, for us, there's the water component. Um, we also, there's also hydrogeology and a lot of issues like that. There's the, um, so I wouldn't say we're going to be the collector of all data, but we need a lot of it to be able to make our decisions. So what we want to do is not necessarily be a repository. We want folks to share information with us so that we can um, work with them to compare data. And we want to be able to model things. You know, we're hearing there's a model for the groundwater sustainability plan. We'd like to see that model, see how it works, have our folks who are experts on these things as well, get in there, dig around, see what they can find out. Um, because again, this has to be, if, if we as a regulatory agency were put in a position to take regulatory action, it has to be defensible. And so for us, it really does need that scientific basis. And, um, and that there are many different ways to look at data. You know, there are, there are narrative components, which are very important. I think Luis went into that a lot into the biological component, but, um, but we need to get that information. So for us, maybe we are collecting it. I wouldn't say we're going to be the holder of the data where if people want to come to us, they're going to get it because we're not fish biologists. So we certainly wouldn't want to be the ones talking about that. We are not cultural experts. So we wouldn't want to be the ones having that discussion, but we need to be aware of the data. So um, given the urgency of this and the uh, that's been mentioned many times throughout today. What is the timeline that you're looking at for all this data collection? That's a very good question. Yesterday, I mean, it's it's a horrible response, but really as quickly as possible. Ideally, we, we have reached out to folks. They are starting, you know, data is trickling in, and it's really as quickly as we can also analyze it, which takes some time. Um, but ideally, if if the spawn, if they're going to start spawning or running potentially, you know, in February, we would like to be able to see progress immediately. And we're not sure what's going to happen with that. The storms may have provided us with a bit of a buffer. It's unclear right now. Last year, we saw what happened. Wonderful snowpack, wonderful water supply diminished very quickly. And that could go away quickly. So we don't want there to be an idea that oh, we're okay because we had the rains, we can push it off. So that's definitely where we're coming from, um, but as quickly as possible. Okay, so you're looking for input, looking for collaboration, um, looking for short-term strategies, long-term strategies. So is, is there a local working group that is being facilitated that people can join or how, how does that look? That's a good question. We don't have a specific local working group right now because we've just started to identify who the folks are, but there's a lot of folks who have been working on this for a long time already. And right. so we are identifying those groups. We have an implementation team within um, the state agencies and some of the key players that are working on the data collaboration and sharing those types of, of aspects. Um, if it makes sense to have a group that does that, we would be interested in facilitating it. So it's an idea that we'll take back. Um, but I think uh, one area of concern that I have is because of the, the different competing ideas that sometimes it's easier for us to meet with folks independently. And then we have the listening sessions where we bring folks together and that's where we can have the discussion and dialogue. Um, but for the long term, I could see um, having a group like that. However... I don't want to start another group if there's already a local group doing these types of things and we're hearing that there are a lot of discussions happening. So it might make better sense for us to piggyback off of those. We're only one agency right. and our purview is narrow relative to some of the broader things that are happening with, you know, fish and wildlife, the county's efforts, things of that. Okay. Anybody else from the board? Supervisor Crandall? Just one quick thing. I was uh, glad to hear that you were... Uh, um, going to move forward some uh, resources to help with illegal grows because uh, in my opinion I feel like that's an unchecked situation that is also um, 
you know, causing a hindrance to all of this and kind of putting us all in a position to be kind of like um, basically, you know, fighting over resources, if it makes sense. Um, but I don't know the amount. We, none of us know the amount of how much water they're diverting. I just know there is a lot of illegal grows. And um, we have one person that does that work in the county. And so we've been talking to different agencies that could help with that. So I'm glad to hear that you're going to be doing that because uh, if we can get that situation under control, that could help with that and many other things. So I just wanted to add that. And I actually had that comment too. Um, when you're talking about enforcement, are you going to be looking at the entire watershed for these creeks? Because the communities upstream, for example, Kelsey Creek, in Kelseyville, we're seeing these problems with the hitch, but it starts in my community at the top of the watershed. And there's a lot going on in between the community of Cobb at the headwaters and down here in Big Valley. Um, yeah, so we're, oh, sorry. Um, so we're taking a look at basically everything that feeds into Clear Lake. Um, so pretty broad, broad approach. So there's like over 200 water right holders that we're looking at. And basically we're just going through every water right and ensuring that they're in compliance with the permit, um, ensuring that they're reporting uh, as they should, um, and those who aren't, we're following up on various enforcement actions. Um, so basically, if it drains into Clear Lake, we're, we're taking a look at it at the moment, um, both in the cannabis side and non-cannabis. Non but you're prioritizing those four creeks? Pri yeah, the five creeks we're prioritizing, so mostly Adobe, Kelsey, Manning, um, Coal, and Middle are the five creeks that we're prioritizing. But in general, we are, we are kind of looking at everything into Clear Lake anyway. Okay. Supervisor Spatier. So you mentioned water rights and you mentioned enforcement. And what I have not heard, nor do I see in this presentation, is anyone uh, discussing or uh, any representation from Yolo County Flood Control. Uh, they have the rights not only to the lake, but the streams feeding into the lake as well, as I understand, uh, since it fills up the lake. Um, what can you do to help us to get them to be here? Because they're not here. That's a good point. Yeah, I don't think we've reached out to Yolo County um, just yet. But yeah, my understanding is a lot, Yolo, Yolo County has some senior water rights that they're um, um, appropriated. And so that is going to be a difficulty. Um, but at this time, I don't think we've reached out to Yolo County. Um, but that's something we can take back and, and look into. Okay. Now, have we looked into Yolo County? No. Nothing with Yolo County just yet, but we're aware of the water rights. Because I, I know that we are under a decree on how lake water can be utilized, especially for agriculture. Um, and their lack of presence here, I'd like to know, is that a breach of what we have agreed upon? Um, because to me, uh, we all need to take the responsibility that we own, and I do not see them. Uh, and I'd love to see them here and be involved in this conversation. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, thank you, and we can move on to the next presentation. What? I'm not sure if Mr. Sklar is here. He is. He is. He's in the back. He's in the yeah. Back. Okay. He's there. Yeah. All right. Marina, is the Blue Ribbon Committee next? Yes, uh, Chair Paiska, that is correct. Eric Sklar, the chair of the Blue Ribbon Committee, is next. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Paiske and uh, Supervisors. I'm Eric Sklar, 13333 Big Canyon Road. I'm a member of the California Fishing Game Commission, and at the request of Natural Resources Secretary Wade Crowfit, I chair the Blue Ribbon Committee for the Re Restoration of Clear Lake, the BRC. My fellow Fishing Game Commissioner, Erica Zavalada, did a great job of representing the commission. I don't have anything to add other than to endorse her comments about the commission's role and say how proud I am that the commission kick-started this effort back in October, well, really in August and through our meetings in October and December. And I'm glad that we're moving fast. I know it's not fast enough. Um, it's complicated with all these different state agencies. In the end, um, uh, you know, it, it takes all of us to do this together. Um, so I'm really here today as the chair of the BRC, not as a Fish and Game Commissioner representative. And I want to thank uh, all the members of the commission for their hard work over the uh, past months, including Sarah Ryan, who was here today, and members of the board who've served on the committee. I know uh, Supervisor Green is joining us shortly. Um, I, I'm going to give the usual caveat that I'm not speaking for the commi uh, committee on anything that might happen in the future. But we wanted to be here today to say that, um, that given that, that the critical status of the, of the Clear Lake Hitch is a, is a top priority of the BRC and, as you know, of the Fish and Game Commission as well. Um, 
at our meeting tomorrow of the BRC, we'll discuss sending a letter to the governor, the state, our state senator, our assembly member, and others, urging further action, including but not limited to the following. An emergency listing under the Federal Endangered Species Act by the Fish and, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, any activities <coughs> that, are, uh, uh, that you guys ask for, for us in the proclamation if you pass it today. Um, voluntary re reductions in water diversions impacting spawning grounds. Um, immediate restoration of existing fish passes on Kelsey Creek and removal of barriers for spawning and other uh, Clear Lake, uh, uh, Kelsey Creek and other Clear Lake spawning tributaries. Um, it's important to know that the BRC is not designed for emergency action and it's not a regulatory or statutory body, um, but we are a great convener. Um, and so one of the things that we, we'll talk about, which uh, was you know, brought up in the last presentation, is possibly providing a facilitator who can be a regular coordinator of all these different groups because there's a real possibility that one hand won't know what the other's doing and we need to have that coordination. We have a facilitator who's terrific and if the committee agrees, we can make that facilitator from Sacramento State available to help with this. The, committee, the BRC can continue to be uh, a forum for outreach and coordination and education. Um, furthermore, um, over the long run, the committee's real work is to restore the lake so that this is solved over the long run. We, we've got to look at short-term solutions over the coming weeks, not months, but weeks. But over the long run, we, we want to work with the supervisors and with these other organizations so that over the long run, we restore the lake so all the tributaries are functioning properly, so the lake is clean, deal with invasive species that are predators of the hitch and other uh, uh, native species. Um, and so. Um, we just wanted to be here today so that we, we look forward to seeing if you have a proclamation that includes requests from the uh, committee, which we'll respond to in our meeting tomorrow. So we'll be watching to the end of the meeting to see uh, what you'd like us to do. Um, and I do want to mention one thing that was brought up by the ag groups. Um, and I'm sorry if they feel that they haven't been included. I'm a farmer. I've been growing grapes for 45 years. Um, and so, and I'm the chair of the BRC and I'm 20% of the Fish and Game Commission. So you've already got some agricultural representation on those bodies. Um, and all <coughs> the meetings are, are publicly noticed and, uh, and, and are open to the public. We did have a, a member of the, a representative of the Farm Bureau from Lake County at the BRC meetings regularly early on and I haven't seen anybody from there for a while. So I'd encourage the ag community to send somebody. Um, but I just want to thank the, the supervisors for really taking a lead in this, keeping us uh, all moving on it. You got to keep kicking us because, you know, there are, again, there are a lot of groups involved. And if we're going to get something done in the next weeks, it's going to be incumbent on all of us to keep pushing. So thank you very much for the effort. Thank you. I believe we might be at our last presentation. Is that right? There she is. That is correct. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, you guys are not done hearing from me just yet. Hi, everyone. Marina Villajana, Deputy Water Resources Director for the Lake County Water Resources Department and Watershed Protection District. I would like to just take this time to start out and thank you um, to all of our presenters for being able to provide this information and folks that have remained with us via Facebook, Granicus, Zoom, and in the board chambers. Um, we acknowledge it's a lot of information, but we hope it's good information, and I can, I can vouch for that. So I want to just take off, um, start us off with just overlying really quick the role of the Water Resources Department. Um, our staff works awfully hard. Um, as you can see, we wear many hats in our department. So I want to give um, a big thank you and kudos to the Water Resources team. Um, what we are tasked with here in the Lake County Water Resources Department is the protection and preservation of Clear Lake, um, California's largest natural lake. And with that, as you can see, I've highlighted some programs here, programs and projects that we in the department and oversee that compile and actually reach this goal of the protection and preservation with Clear Lake. The ones I have highlighted um, to me are the ones that directly impact the Clear Lake hitch. When we talk about protection and preservation, you have to think of all aspects, right? So whether it be about the environmental, I mean, also advocating for those that don't have a voice, um, specifically the hitch, right? And then also the economic um, aspect of it as well. So some of the specific programs and projects that we oversee with the Water Resources Department includes aquatic plant management, aids to navigation, groundwater monitoring and management, um, specifically as it relates to California Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, um, which I will be, excuse me, I just dropped my water bottle, I'm um, discussing later on in the presentation, lake bed management, Highland Springs recreation area, stormwater management, surface water quality monitoring, 
environmental education and outreach. We love to talk about our lake and share any data that we have and information regarding such. And then the Middle Creek Restoration Project. So with this, as you can imagine, it definitely takes a lot of coordination and collaboration with folks from tribal entities, state and federal levels, um, and local groups as well. Um, so I definitely want to give thanks to those folks that we actively engage with. So I'm going to highlight some of these key projects that I've talked about specifically, um, again, as it relates um, to our Clear Lake Hitch. So the first part I want to touch upon is Highland Springs and Adobe Reservoir. So we at the Watershed Protection District are tasked with overseeing Highland, um, Highland Springs and Adobe Reservoir, um, both of the reservoirs and the two dams associated with such. That is because it is a flood control structure. So Highland Creek specifically, um, you can see some information here. So this is an earth filled dam with a maximum height of 61 feet and a length of 510 feet. Um, you can see information here regarding the primary um, spillway the storage and then the secondary spillway as well. The primary spillway limits outflow to Highland Creek to 560 CFS. And as EPA Director for Big Valley Rancheria, Sarah Ryan stated, we are in the process of placing a transducer um, collaborating with Big Valley um, Rancheria, and we're hoping to bring that MOU before the, before the board in early February. So once we are able to actually um, put that in place, that's going to be really exciting for us to be able to see that data um, and be able to share that data um, specifically with the community. So just highlighting a little bit about the operations of our Highland Creek Reservoir and the dam operations. So the primary spillway limits the Highland Creek to 560 CFS as shared. When inflow exceeds the outflow, the reservoir levels increase. The stored water is detained until inflow reduces to below outflow. This reduces the peak flows downstream and reduces flood risk. All wall flows are reduced, high flows are prolonged. So again, the, op, the goal of this is flood risk reduction um, and flood management, hence the reason we operate these two uh, structures. Now jumping on over to Adobe Creek Reservoir. This is also an earth flow dam with a maximum height of 23 feet and a length of 1,300 feet. Highlighting on some of the key operations of our Adobe Creek Dam, the primary spillway limits outflow to Adobe Creek to 940 cubic feet per second, CFS, also known as. When inflow exceeds the outflow, reservoir levels increase. The stored water is detained until inflow reduces to below outflow. So as we are talking about flood control, so our Watershed Protection District, and you may notice that I'm using Water Resources Department and Watershed Protection District interchangeably. I'm hoping I'm not throwing too many people off with that. Same department, same team members on board, um, just wearing different hats in terms of um, um, what we are tasked with and our authority, et cetera. So the Watershed Protection District is um, tasked with the um, operation and management of the levees, levees in the upper basin. Folks may be familiar with this um, as it relates to our upper lake community. So what our O&M activities include and that we're tasked with is levee patrolling, especially during and after high water events. You may have noticed our team members out there, um, whether it be at 2 or 3 a.m. when peak flows were occurring um, or just during the business hours of doing um, routine monitoring of our levee infrastructure um, and working very closely with our department, um, our public works department as well. If need be, we are tasked um, with coordinating with our operation um, emergency services and other um, emergency responders as it relates to flood fight. Um, we do work very closely with the California Department of Water Resources who provides training um, once a year to our staff and we invite other folks from tribal entities um, and local entities as well to participate in that training because we all know um, and that has been a reoccurring theme in this discussion is all hands on deck. Um, we also are tasked with mowing of the grasses on the levee, control of weeds and herbicides, removal of excess woody growth, that includes trees and bushes within the levee easements, maintenance of levee roads, and removal and trimming of trees and brush within Creek's active channel area, and periodic removal of sediment deposits. Now, that all may seem um, a lot easier said than done. Some of our biggest barriers that we've been tasked with um, over the years is, of course, lack of funding. So we are not a part of the general fund. We do have different zones of benefits. All this information is public information and is shared, of course, during mid-years and budgets. Um, you can see the revenue that does come in for these different zones, um, including our zone um, that operates and oversees the budget of our of our reclam um, excuse me of our levy system. 
So the amount of funding and revenue that we are able to bring in um, through taxes is very minimal compared to the cost of operation. So this has been a longstanding issue since at least 1999. The last successful um, increase in revenue was in 1999 when we were able to hold a vote um, and approve a special benefit assessment. In the past, we have tried to conduct this. Um, we've tried to do a reassessment as we know that costs increase. Um, what we are tasked with from Army Corps of Engineers and our friends at DWR, um, they come out and do inspections twice a year. Um, the requirements have gone up as well, and we know that takes a lot of um, resources. Um, so we've tried to hold these um, increase the zone of benefits um, and the revenue in these areas um, in the most recent years, but we have been unsuccessful. So this creates a barrier um, due to the amount of funding that it takes to maintain these facilities um, and the revenue that we bring in. Another, um, another barrier that we've encountered in terms of the operation and maintenance of our levy system includes the um, permitting requirements. We have a stream but alteration agreement also referred to as SAA. We love acronyms in the water world said that once and I'll continue to say that again. Um, and there's different requirements that we have to follow. So going through the process of getting this stream bed alteration agreement, um, we work very closely with our friends at California Department of Fish and Wildlife. They're the ones that issue these permits. Um, of course, that takes that takes um, a good, good chunk of change to issue um, apply for that permit. And then we also have very strict requirements of when we can actually go out in the creek. And on top of that, of course, it takes close um, collaboration with our um, friends in the tribal um, consultation areas to ensure that we are handling any sort of um, um, sensitive, tribal sensitive material in the most appropriate manner. Um, and then just the permitting requirements as it relates to hitch habitat. Now, um, the objective is, you know, when we go out there and we're able to operate and maintain the creeks, um, you're removing gravel and vegetation, which we all understand could be hitch barriers. Now, moving on um, to another project as it relates to flood control and also hitch habitat. Once implemented, um, we are still in the planning page, play, excuse me, stages of our Middle Creek Flood Damage Reduction and Ecosystem, Racing Pro uh, Ecosystem Restoration Project, another mouthful, but we also refer to it as our Middle Creek Flood Control Project. So this takes close collaboration um, with folks um, in the state level, federal level, and local level, um, including tribal governments as well. Um, this area ultimately is reclaiming that um, those levee systems that were, that were constructed in the 1900s and restoring this area back to wetland habitat. Once we are actually able to plan and implement this Middle Creek restoration project, not only will it reduce flood risk to the Upper Lake community, it's also gonna be improving our water quality. As you can see a little snippet here, um, this project area is close, um, is connected to the Stotts Creek and Middle Creek, two of the largest tributaries that flow into our beautiful lake. And this will reduce um, phosphorus offloading into Clear Lake by 71%. But most importantly, this will also provide hitch habitat um, for our, our Clear Lake Hitch friends um, by restoring that area back to wetlands, um, connecting Scotts Creek and um, Middle Creek um, in a more accessible format to this wetland habitat um, that some of the predators may not be able to reach um, for the Clear Lake Hitch. Lake bed management. So our department is also tasked with lake bed management um, per the State Lands Commission. So one aspect that I would like to touch upon regarding lake bed management is we take in all the permits um, for anything that is constructed or placed um, within our um, lake. That is Lake Port at 7.79 feet Rumsey. I won't dive deep into Rumsey right now, but there's a lot of great information on Rumsey and then all this material that has been presented during my slides um, on our water resources website, which I have a link to at the end of this discussion. So with that, um, we have worked very closely with CDFW for the past few years to modify our lake bed encroachment permitting process to reduce any impacts that the, the development and um, and repair and um, installation of these lake bed structures may have on specifically the Clear Lake Hitch habitat. How have we done that? One is com constant communication, education, and engagement with the consultants and the contractors that develop on the lake, with the parcel owners. And then most importantly, we have required that every encroachment permit that comes in for lake bed permitting completes a supplemental environmental questionnaire. And we worked again very closely with our friends at CDFW to develop this specifically to the Clear Lake Hitch habitat. 
So what this questionnaire does is as folks apply for this permit, we are able to gain a better idea of the project specific location. And not only do we have them fill this out, but we at Water Resources go out there and fact check um, everything that is on this questionnaire. We send all this information to CDFW because there is a work window that we, um, we, we have consultants and contractors strictly follow um, due to the Clear Lake Hitch spawning habitat. Again, it takes a lot of close collaboration and coordination with different entities. Um, and I just would like to highlight that aspect um, and those modifications that we have done and will continue to do. Um, now, groundwater has come up a lot during this discussion, so I would like to highlight um, just a few information and this, um, bits and pieces of material that were outlined in our Big Valley Groundwater Sustainability Plan. If you want to read the 890 pages, I have the link here of our GSP. Um, I think it's an interesting read, but if not, um, I would just like to briefly cover our GDEs. The link is here. It is currently in review from the California Department of Water Resources, who is tasked with um, overseeing the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which we have one priority basin in our uh, county that complies with SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which is our big valley our Big Valley uh, Basin. Now our Big Valley GSP was approved by our Big Valley Groundwater Sustainability Agency, GSA, which also serves as the Board of Directors of the Watershed Protection District and uh, your Board of Supervisors who I am speaking to. So uh, just very quickly, um, I have two slides here regarding groundwater dependent ecosystems, another acronym, don't worry, there's not gonna be a quiz at the end of this, GDEs. So GDEs are defined as ecological communities or species that depend on groundwater emerging from aquifers or on groundwater occurring near the ground surface. So SIGMA outlines very clearly what we have to develop in our GSP. Um, and basically the focus is to avoid unde undesirable results. All of this information is on our water resources website and on um, on the uh, Lake County, or sorry, excuse me, the DWR website regarding Sigma. So the identification of GDEs can be performed by assessing whether a habitat would exist if groundwater levels were deeper than the root zone. If the answer is no, then it is a GDE. If the answer is yes, the ecosystem would exist if groundwater levels were deeper, then it is not a GDE, and that is important. So the identification of GDEs for our Big Valley Basin relied on the natural communities commonly associated with groundwater, da, 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 another acronym, NCCAG database. Um, all this information is linked. The NCCAG database was developed by a working group composed of the California Department of Water Resources, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Nature Conservancy. So I have here figure 2.58, 2-58. Um, it's here on the right, it's a map. I apologize if it's small, but all of these slides will be available to the public um, via the um, meeting minutes and et cetera. So figure 2-58 shows the habitat locations identified by the NCC AG database within our Big Valley Basin. Wetlands are identified along most of the tributaries to Clear Lake, including Adobe Creek, Kelsey Creek, Manning Creek, Thompson Creek, Hill Creek, and Cole Creek. Riparian mixedwood hardwood habitat, which is 4.52 acres, is identified along the downstream section of Kelsey Creek. This is 2-58 in set one. So this little inset map right here. And then Fremont Cottonwood Habitat, which is 6.9 acres, is identified upstream, um, upstream of Adobe Creek Reservoir, which is in set two of figure 2.2-58. It should be noted that the identified GDEs along Kelsey Creek may also benefit from access to surface water. You can see that from figure 2-59 here. <clears throat> Similarly, the, GD, the GDEs above Adobe Creek Reservoir may also benefit from access to seepage from the reservoir. So here, figure 2-59, um, these are the GDEs along Kelsey Creek. Upstream section is the proximity of Main Street Bridge, which is to the left and then section to the proximity of the groundwater recharge structure, which is overseen by the Watershed Protection District. So here is a map that is also located. Um, if you guys are wanting to, go, wanting to go back to our Big Valley GSP, this is found in chapter two, GSP page 104, specifically PDF page 152. So figure 6-62, uh, sorry, excuse me, figure 2-62 shows the observed death to groundwater and wells in the proximity of the two identified GDEs along Kelsey Creek and above Adobe Creek Reservoir. 
Spring depths are typically about 10 to 20 feet BG, BGS, which is consistent with ground level shown, groundwater levels shown in figure 2-24, which I do not have pictured here, that is located in our Big Valley GSP. Summer depth, as we know, to groundwater can vary across observed wells, ranging from anywhere from 25 to 50 feet BGS. This larger variability in the summer may be due to the effects of groundwater extraction, extraction during dry periods. I would like to note, as stated in our Big Valley GSP, there are no apparent long-term trends of either declining or increasing groundwater levels, suggesting stable groundwater conditions exist in the vicinity of Kelsey Creek groundwater dependent ecosystems between the data we have collected and analyzed ranging from 1985 and 2018. Figure 2-62 shows um, which which shows a different trend between 1965 and 2019, suggests groundwater declining in the area prior to 1985. Um, I would also like to note that the nearest well to the GDEs above Adobe Creek Reservoir is about one half mile to the east. Spring depth to groundwater in the well is 70 to 90 feet BGS, while summer groundwater depths are typically 100 to 100 feet BGS. Note that because of the long distance to the nearest well, the observed groundwater depths may not be indicative of the groundwater around the GDE's location. And that leads me to another aspect that we have highlighted um, in our Big Valley GSP is data gaps. We acknowledge that this was a quick um, process. This was a quick timeline to develop our GSP. Um, I definitely want to give thanks and appreciation to our Big Valley Groundwater Sustainability Plan Advisory Committee and the expert consultants and hydrologists that help us develop our G um, GSP. With that, we outlined um, different data gaps, one being what I just recently stated. So what are we doing to um, repair some of those data gaps? Um, we are actively moving forward with the repair of some of these data gaps and filling in these data gaps to ensure that we have the best available data. Um, again, this definitely takes a lot of close collaboration and efforts. Um, really looking forward to our continued efforts and collaboration with Big Valley Rancheria. Sarah, um, Sarah shared some awesome research that they have done, um, and I know Water Resources um, as well have that's been doing um, some active work and we are continuing those efforts for efforts for groundwater monitoring. I also want to give thanks to the state who have continued to support us in the development in our, of our GSP and our compliance with SIGMA. Um, one recent um, effort that we have completed is the technical support services from our friends through DWR. Um, this is support services from our friends at the state that we have taken advantage of um, and that they are actually expediting our application for two of our wells, um, including what you can see them highlighted here, which um, one being well 008-026-19. This is a parcel close up. And then also well um, 024-201-15. Now these wells um, are located one again on Kelsey Creek and Adobe Creek. The purpose of this is to aid in the high, um, recent high profile efforts to save the Clear Lake Hitch. Um, and again, we are hoping that these wells are installed and the monitoring is able to um, begin by summer of this year. And we do have, um, I just would like to go back that we also do have um, seven additional wells with that TSS application um, throughout the Big Valley Basin that the state is planning on moving us forward with um, come later in the year or early 2024. Um, but they did expedite our request to monitor those two wells, one on Adobe Creek and one on Kelsey Creek. So that's exciting. I'm super excited for that. Now, um, again, as I wrap up, I understand we've thrown a lot of information, but I do just want to um, commend, again, the efforts that local entities have done, the state and federal agencies have done as well. Um, we, at, on behalf of Water Resources, we're continuing, committed to continued um, the prioritization and protection of our Clear Lake Hitch and the habitat and conservation efforts, including collaboration and, um, and such with local, state, and federal agencies, including our friends from tribal entities as well. Um, we have been prioritizing habitat protection conservation but as everyone has said here um, it definitely takes a group effort and I'm really excited that this item is coming before the board um, to continue to gain the encouragement momentum and support for such. Um, I would also like to end on um, a different note as well so stating that since 2015 um, you know this isn't new for us here in water resources we have um, prioritized the hitch we have continued to prioritize hitch habitat and conservation and doing all that we can to do such um, since 2015 our district has applied for over um, 
to over $10 million in grant monies through different state and federal agencies um, for hedge habitat and conservation and have been unsuccessful to date um, multiple times. And this is through different state and federal agency grant applications. Um, we've also product, um, completed follow-up with the um, grantor see how we can modify um, these grant applications that we have developed, made such revisions and still have been unsuccessful for applying for a variety of different um, programs and um, projects through these funding opportunities. So hoping to continue to apply for, for funding um, as that is one big barrier for us at Water Resources. Um, and of course, and just continuing this momentum. Um, here I have a picture we've shared um, previously. I know Luis Santana and Sarah Ryan have stated, um, but again, these are just images from the Adobe Creek Clear Lake Hitch Rescue that our staff um, were able to identify and work very closely and quickly with um, friends from um, different tribal entities and CDFW to rescue all the hitch that were stranded in the full different four different pools. Um, and although the hitch do not look right, um, very happy in this image, all the hitch were, um, were um, alive um, and were able to be um, 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 rescued appropriately. So on that note, um, I'm going to open it up to the board for any questions. And I also will welcome um, Director Scott DeLeon of Public Works and Water Resources to chime in um, for public questions and comments. Uh, thanks, Marina. I don't really have anything left to add. Um, it's uh, you board. You've heard uh, an awful lot of uh, information today, so I'll be available to answer any technical questions or anything you might need. Well, I want to thank all the presenters today. We've heard um, a lot of information. We've heard a lot of data, we've heard a lot of stories, and I think overwhelmingly we've heard that this community cares deeply about the hitch. And um, I, I first wanna open it up to the board for comments and questions on the presentation, then we'll do public comment, but we're, we'll talk about item B, which is the proclamation um, separate from, from this, this public um, comment section. So um, if you have comments about the presentations, this would be the time. And then we'll address the proclamation next. So first I'll open up to the board, Supervisor Spadier. Um, yeah, appreciate all the information. Um, lots to digest. Um, I have a question for water resources. Uh, there's been the comment uh, again and again about the possibility of uh, having some sort of flow from Highland Springs uh, to feed the creeks, uh, uh, probably for both Highland Creek and uh, Adobe Creek. And just kind of curious, based on the CFS that we're hearing, which I think was 34 CFS is what's being requested, and if that's per second, and I tried to do some quick math and looking at the overall acre feet of what is available, my, my math tells me we would need 10,000 acre feet and I don't know that we have 10,000 acre feet so that it, it, just to make sure that we don't talk about something that can't happen uh, am I correct that we don't have the capacity of water available to us to provide that 34 CFS well the, the, the quick answer is no we don't have the capacity um, the Adobe Creek and, and Highlands Creek dams were created uh, as flood control facilities that's been covered already today. Uh, and, you know, using, uh, if, if Highland Springs was full uh, and you released 34 cubic feet per second out of the dam, um, which doesn't mean it's gonna reach uh, downstream to the areas where those fish need that water, uh, but let's just presume that it can do that. Um, it would drain a full uh, a full Highland Springs in 16 days. So obviously we're gonna to need to release a lot more water than that uh, if we were to even get close to trying to get water down uh, to, uh, to the area where they're spawning. Uh, and so no, the capacity is just not there. Um, uh, again, uh, the facility was never intended for that. It was, uh, it, it was a flood control facility. Uh, also, uh, it's important to, to note that during periods of drought, uh, the, the reservoir rarely fills up. I mean, it, and I don't have the numbers 
uh, from what it's been over the last few years, but uh, it has not any not been anywhere near full. Uh, so um, uh, again, that's just a reduction in the available capacity. So the, the, again, the short answer is no, we don't have the capacity to do that. Okay, I appreciate uh, the response to that. Um, and I'll quickly just finish. I think one of the highlights that was spoken of um, by uh, Deputy Director Deligianis is uh, Middle Creek area. And uh, today we have Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Game um, speaking to us. And we ha I haven't seen a partnership to help us push that project through the finish line. And, and I sure hope that we can take advantage of this situation while we are in discussion uh, to work together to make that happen. That's 1,200 plus acres that we would be able to add to not only water storage and flood control, but also for hitch habitat for spawning grounds. Uh, and I think that's an important potential because uh, I think there's many pieces to this puzzle, and that is definitely, in my opinion, one major piece of the puzzle that I hope we can pass through the finish line. Um, this is something that I, uh, I'm very passionate about finishing, and uh, sure hope that we can th take this opportunity to move it forward. Supervisor Green? Yeah, just do a little housekeeping here. Uh, I know they weren't presenting, but we do have a U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, on Zoom, and they either wanted to present a comment or clarify or be available for questions. So, Marina, maybe you can uh, uh, kick in and uh, clarify what's, uh, what's up with that. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Supervisor Green. Um, so we do have friends from um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We have Michael Fries as field supervisor and Amber Aguilera, biologist with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Don't want to throw them on the spot, but I would just like to open it up to them um, to share any final comments um, before we do move on with the item and open it up for public comment. Hi, I don't know if you can hear me. This is Michael Friss. Yes, we can hear you. I don't know if you can see me either, but um, I'll, I'll talk anyway. Okay, I, I wrote down, so we wrote down some comments here um, so I can avoid using the word um too often and make this go quickly. Um, but again, I'm Mike Friss. I'm the field supervisor in the Sacramento Fish and Wildlife Office. I'm joined by Amber Aguilera, who also works in the Sacramento Fish and Wildlife Office. And um, I've got a, a few comments I'd like to make just to, before we dig in. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service is committed to conserving the hitch. We care about the importance uh, to the tribes, the, the fish's importance to the tribes in the region. We care about its importance to the local community and economy, and we care about its role in the local ecosystem. We're committed to conserving this species. We have been and we will continue to invest in efforts that are contributing to the conservation of the species. The service has provided and will continue to provide funding to both the USGS and the local tribes for monitoring research and habitat restoration projects related to the Clear Lake Hitch. This information, both scientific and historic, will help us as we assess the status of the fish ourselves. We currently are preparing uh, or, or pursuing internal funding um, for fish passage funds within the Fish and Wildlife Services coffers um, to, to provide for more uh, funding for fish passage, uh, fish barrier removals. Second, the service is about to embark on a process to reevaluate the status of the Clear Lake Hitch. We've received a request to emergency list the hitch that we expect to respond to in, in the month of February. If we don't emergency list the hitch, we're scheduled to issue a 12 month finding. That's a finding as to whether listing of the species is warranted or not by no later than January, 2025. We are scheduled to begin our process for collecting information for the species um, uh, in, the, in the very near future, by no later than this summer. We will broadcast that call for information widely, and we hope to receive comments from many of you who are here today. Finally, we have been committed to completing the conservation strategy for the hitch, and we want to do that in the, in the near future, certainly in 2023. Over the past five years, we have developed this conservation strategy alongside many partners, including tribes, local organizations, and state and local government agencies. 
The strategy itself addresses issues that are impacting the Clear Lake Hitch and the watershed that you've heard about from other speakers today. The current version of the conservation strategy, although still a draft, identifies goals, objectives, and actions that are needed to improve the species and the habitat. Because these actions have been specifically identified, the draft strategy has also already helped secure funding for several restoration projects. The service views this conservation strategy as a species recovery plan, and we intend to complete and implement the strategy regardless of the species federal listing status. In sum, we're dedicated to continuing coordinate coordination with the state, with the county, with local tribes, and the rest of the community to protect and conserve the Clear Lake Hitch. And I'll stop there and be available for, for questions. Thank you. Supervisor Green. Yeah, this came up at the summit, and uh, if you can just clarify, and for the people in the audience, this has uh, two bouncing balls. So there was a, a court settlement uh, uh, that uh, did send U.S. Fish and Wildlife, basically rebooted the examination in uh, 2020. Uh, the initial ruling was that uh, listing under the Federal Endangered Species Act was not warranted at that time. Uh, there was a lawsuit and a settlement, and so the re-examination, what you're calling the 12-month uh, listing examination, is going to proceed uh, under that court order and hopefully wrap up no later than January 25. There's a second bigger ball floating out there right now, and that was the request made by the Fish and Game Commission, followed up uh, by the request made by the tribes and the Center for Biological Diversity that would uh, basically declare the fish endangered now under the federal law uh, while the review continues as to whether it should be permanently listed or at least listed under the 12 month. Um, there was a lot of back and forth about what the potential impact of an emergency listing would be if it happened right now or the potential impact if it was uh, declared endangered under federal law concluding your new review. And one of the comments uh, made would be, hey, it may shake loose some money uh, that would not be available otherwise so we can uh, get some uh, projects going to actually save this fish. Um, but uh, we didn't dive into some of the other uh, potentially disruptive impacts of that. So can you just give us the 30-second elevator speech, which is impossible, I know, um, <clears throat> but the potential impacts, uh, good and bad, uh, that could come if emergency listing is granted? If, if an emergency listing occurred or if the species were listed, um, what that confers, what the endangered species confers is, a, is, in part, is a prohibition on take of the species. So that means if somebody's out there, you know, killing or harming uh, the, the species, there would be prohibitions against those sorts of activities. Now, there are ways around that. Certainly, it, you know, listed species are taken quite often, and there are ways of permitting that process. We work with federal agencies to authorize the take of listed species through a federal consultation process. Often when we're working with a federal agency, there are other local sponsors, either the state or local government or private landowners that are involved in that. But our consultation is is with the other federal agency who has an obligation to consult it with us when they have when they take actions that could potentially you know harm this could potentially affect the listed species i, I recognize this is all a little bit of legalese but hang bear with me now when there are no federal agencies involved in in an activity there is still a prohibition on take and take is you know, if you will, illegal at that point in time. Um, a private landowner or a state or a private company can come to us or uh, to, to um, work on getting a take permit for that species. And we have a number of mechanisms by which we can actually authorize the take um, of otherwise lawful activities. And the, some of the things that you may have heard be, about before are habitat conservation plans, um, candidate conservation agreements, safe harbor agreements. There's a number of different mechanisms we use to authorize the take of a species. So overall, yeah, the, the species is, is protected from, from take at that point in time. Now, as you've heard from some of the other speakers is, 
is with the Clear Lake hitch, one of the challenges here is that there's no real smoking gun. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not as though somebody's going out and killing the species, you know, purposefully or anything like that. So, so take prohibitions become a little tricky and we would, we are still wondering what the net effect of, of a federal listing would be in an area where it does not seem that there's a whole lot of federal actions going on. Um, and so we're not, we're, we're, we're not quite exactly sure what our role would be in this particular system. Nevertheless, you know, the, the species listing would draw more attention to the species, um, potentially add more, you know, funding opportunities. However, we have not experienced ourselves any instance where, you know, funding our ability to fund actions for the species was limited by whether it was listed or not. Um, so, so far, so, so good. We've been doing really well on our ability to, to get funds for this species, and we're hoping that would continue. I'll stop right there and see if you got follow-up questions. No, thank you. That, that, that was the 30-second elevator speech. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. okay. So, I'll open it up to the public, and... You can come up to the podium. Please keep it to three minutes when you hear my timer go off. Uh, we have a lot of people, I think, that want to speak. So let's uh, move through this respectfully and, and get through our time, and, and then we'll get to item B. So speak, um, sorry, come up to the podium, give your name, and you have three minutes. Good afternoon, uh, commissioners. Um, so I thought I should stand up and say something since my name was on the previous slide. I'm Fred Fira. I'm a research fish biologist with the California Water Science Center with the U.S. Geological Survey based in Sacramento. Um, so I'm the one who's responsible for all the USGS data you've been hearing about. Um, I don't have anything necessarily to add to what others, including the Department of Fish and Game, uh, Wildlife has addressed today. Um, but I am available to answer questions today or anytime at your convenience if you have them about our programs and the data. Thank you. Supervisors, I'm Phil Moy. Um, I have a question for the, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service regarding the, the listing and a potential incidental take in regards basically to uh, what if. What if there's a stranding of hitch in a stream after it's listed, the emergency or otherwise, and someone says, oh, it was groundwater pumping that did it. It was this, this vineyard or that vineyard or this uh, orchard. <coughs> Could that farmer or, or that operation be held liable or, or otherwise uh, be held responsible for that take and what would happen? Thank you, and um, yes, if you could answer that question, that'd be great, thanks. I could try, that's, that's a real tough thing to speculate about. Normally, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of circumstances that would go into that, um, that, would, that would probably make a difference. Overall, you know, if, I, I, would, I would say this, if, if you're finding dead fish in the river because the river is dry, you know, it, you know, our, our, you know, folks would have to draw the chain of events to kind of, you know, place blame or, or uh, you know, cause on, on certain activities. Um, and, and so it would, it, it seems to me like that would be a, a, you know, a, without knowing the circumstances of it, it would be impossible for me to judge that. But Overall, if it's in a, a stream where there's a number of people diverting and a number of water uses and a number of, you know, different things going on, it, it seems like that's, that's kind of a tough thing to attribute to one individual. Um, but again, that's, I'm speculating based on, you know, the hypothetical question. So I have a tough time with that one. Overall, I, I guess my answer is I don't know. It would depend on those circumstances. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Good evening, uh, Board of Supervisors. Thank you guys so much for bringing this all together. Wow, huh? Um, so I, I have a question for Marina. 
Um, if she's there, is she there? She should be. Okay. <clears throat> I'm really trying to just put all this information together in my head. I don't think anybody here doesn't care about fish species or any of that, right? I think everybody does care, and that's why everybody's here. Um, and <coughs> what I think we really have to pay attention to is not winding up bickering amongst each other and then not taking care of the fish, right? That's the main thing. We can't fight amongst ourselves to the point that we don't get anything done. Um, so, Marina, if you are there, I wanted to ask you about... Uh, some of your data. Go ahead and ask. She's there. Okay. Um, so if I understood you correctly, it sounded like you said to me um, that groundwater levels for the time periods that you looked at in between Kelsey Creek or Adobe Creek and Kelsey Creek, that they were stable. Did I understand that correctly? So, yes. Um, if you follow along on PDF page 152, um, the statement that was made on the presentation was there are no apparent long-term trends of either declining or increasing groundwater levels, suggesting stable groundwater conditions exist in the vicinity of Kelsey Creek groundwater dependent ecosystems between 1985 and 2018, the data that was collected and analyzed. So this figure um, that we had that I shared, and I can go ahead and share my screen again just to make it easy for everyone. One second. Right. And you guys see that? No. Yeah, exactly. So when I look oh, at that. One second. Sorry, oh, I wasn't sorry. finished. Um, so again, with this data that was collected and analyzed um, between 1965 and um, 2019, um, stated on figure two. Um, it shows the different trends um, between these these eight uh, these years, um, and suggests groundwater declining in the area prior to 1985. Um, also stated that during this, the nearest well to the GDEs above Adobe Creek and res Reservoir, which is about one half mile to the east, spring depth to groundwater in this well is 70 to 90 feet BGS, while summer groundwater depths are typically 100 to 150 feet BGS. Um, note that because this is a long distance to this nearest well, the observed groundwater depths may not be indicative of the conditions around the GDE's location. And all the background material of the modeling um, that the consultants onboarded co collected were outlined in um, the Big Valley GSP. Okay, excellent. So, um, so you know, and, and hopefully nobody takes us the wrong direction. I, I'm just trying to clarify for myself. So, if we're saying in the vicinities of the streams that we're talking about, right, in general vicinity, groundwater is relatively stable. If we're going with the premise that when we pump groundwater out, we're dropping the level of the stream, that would seem like they don't coincide if the groundwater is stable. Do you, uh, maybe I'm tracking wrong here, but if groundwater is stable and I, and, but we're seeing the streams go down, then it would seem like the water that is for the stream is not connected to the groundwater. And again, I'm just talking out loud as far as I'm trying to understand how these things correlate. So maybe somebody could chime in and, and help me understand better if, if that's a good presumption or if that's a bad presumption. Because um, it is a presumption, but based on the fact that groundwater is stable, then somebody pumping it wouldn't be relative to the water on top. They're, they're disconnected. So in that case, we're actually talking about surface water and not groundwater, but the issue still at, at large, right? The issue itself is we don't have surface water. And so I would, I, it comes to my mind that nobody really has addressed the hydrology that has changed here in Lake County relatively recently or in the past five years because of all the fires that we've had, which basically decimates the hydrology of this entire area. You know, the amount of acreage that's been removed, which is what builds our aquifers, which, what drives the water into our ground or even slowly dissipates it into the streams are all the trees, which are, you know, they're burnt all the way around us in massive amounts. So that's just something that came to my mind as, I've been sitting here listening to this whole conversation and know my time's up, so I'll step down. Thank you. Thank you. 
Didn't say his name for the record. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Michael Wagner, thank you. Hi, I'm Pat Scully. I'm the general manager of Scully Packing Company. We grow and pack pears in Kelsoville area. Um, at the risk of using my three minutes, and I hope this doesn't use my three minutes, but I'd like Marina to ask Marina if she could go a little deeper into what the correlation was between surface flows of groundwater and pumping that was concluded in the GSP. I was part of that advisory committee. I think David Weiss and, and Peter Windrum also mentioned this, and I would like a little more clarification from Marina if she would give that. Okay, I'll pause your time while she answers the question. Okay, thanks. You know, I'm going to, Marina, I don't know if you want to try to tackle that. Um, the, the groundwater sustainability plan is a, is a very large document. It's very complex. Um, we've, we've presented some summaries from it. Um, what, what I'd like to do is offer uh, to, to print out the um, applicable sections. And, um, and then if Mr. Scully would like to come up, we'd be happy to present those to him. Uh, allow him to go through those and maybe uh, present that or discuss it on the side. But to, to do a deep dive into the groundwater sustainability plan and, and its findings uh, at, at this juncture, I, I, I would really prefer that uh, we do that offline. Okay, well, I'll just, so with that being said, Scott, I'd be happy to take you up on that. We also sat in a lot of meetings and went through this, and the finding was is there is no correlation between groundwater pumping levels and the surface flows, little or no. I mean, pretty much it was non-existent. It was a part, it was one of the seven items that they needed to address in the groundwater management plan. They did it, and that was the finding. Um, I think the biggest concern here is, is all this talk that's just come up recently about groundwater pumping, frost protection during the hitch run. And now that's drying up the creeks. The information that we have and the data that we have says that that's not the case. And even more concerning is then we see these letters from the uh, California Fish and Game Commission that are calling for a moratorium on new wells and a ban on frost water pumping. It's just, it's just crazy to think that they could have taken that information or where they're getting this information from. I know during the course of the GSP, uh, Sarah Ryan was, we were all told if we have any information that would make a different story than what they were coming up with to present it. Nothing was presented. That's not true. Okay. It wasn't presented well, in the meeting. I'll let you. Okay. okay. So that being said, um, I hope you consider that when, when you're thinking about kicking this up to the to the state to solve this problem for us. I think we all are committed to solving the hitch problem. Uh, you know, I don't think we need to be letting 34 cubic feet per second out of Adobe Creek to enhance the flows a little bit. That would, that would certainly help. Um, may, maybe there's something that could be done there. Maybe, maybe there's not a whole lot of enhancement in most years that would, could help solve the problem. Anyway, without groundwater pumping and frost control, I think David Weiss said it earlier, you're not going to have a pear industry or a grape industry in Big Valley. So, thank you. Thank you. Rebecca Harper, Lake County Farm Bureau. I just had a question specifically for Michael Friss. He mentioned very briefly the Clear Lake Hitch conservation strategy, and I'd be appreciative if he could just give a brief summar summary of the importance that the finalization of that document has with regard to the voluntary actions um, and implementation steps that are to be taken with regard to the hitch. Uh, yes, this is Michael Friss, and um, I, I, I think I'm going to try and answer that question, but then I'm going to hand off to Amber Aguilera to see if she has any further comments she'd want to make. I, she is one of the originators of the, the conservation strategy from our agency um, and has worked on it for a long time. Um, you know, we've been working on this for five years as a number of actions within the, the, uh, the conservation strategy, which... Um, are, are designed to either get more information or specifically to, to identify what types of, of 
information or what types of restoration projects um, are needed, you know, to in order to help conserve the species. Um, that is a collection that is done by a number of, of, of stakeholders, members of the tribes, um, state agencies, um, um, local ag uh, participants, I believe, as well. And, and, and so it is, it is um, a document that we're, we're trying to finalize. Ultimately, it's our document, but we'd like to get the conservation strategy signed off by uh, the other participating members there. Um, once it is signed off, um, that means that there's an agreement of a, a, a plan or a strategy to move forward, at least generally on those actions, and would help to identify certain actions that folks tend to agree on our priority actions for the species. We would anticipate a changing that document as time goes on. I think right now the schedule is once every five years or so, we will amend it. It could be done more frequently or less frequently, depending on need. Um, I don't think there's anything in that document that would preclude us from working on right now. So, you know, the finalizing the conservation strategy document is important because I think we would like to get the symbolic, you know, agreement from others that they are on board with conserving the species. But it does not mean we could not implement some of those actions, you know, right now. I hope that helps clarify, and I'm going to hand off to Amber to see to see I, what I missed. I, I think I think just in I don't know. Should I, I I think we should just proceed. If you yeah. want to respond no, to that, no, that's okay. That's all I'm great. Was looking for. <laughs> okay, thank you. Anyone else in the chambers? Hi, uh, Janine Pfeiffer, ethnoecologist, um, consultant with Big Valley Band of Pomo Indians, uh, both the EPA and the cultural director, um, former UC Davis San Jose State lecturer, masters in agronomy, if you know what that is, agriculturalist, um, and worked for the World Bank Food and Agricultural Organization on $100 million projects overseas, so I am familiar a bit with agriculture. And um, I just wanted to share something that uh, a young, very impressive tribal member shared with me after the presentations that contained either erroneous or misleading information. And he said to me, you know, when we give a presentation, we have to have all of our facts correct. We have to have all of our graphics and our data checked and scientifically verifiable. Why doesn't everyone else have to do that? And I would be very happy to speak with Mr. Windrum on the side and uh, talk to him about why that 5% figure makes absolutely no sense scientifically. I don't want to do it take up time right now. But as a scientist, um, I'm offended <laughs> that that was presented in a public meeting. And I would like to see all of us do better. Because yes, we all need to sit at the table. Um, ag absolutely has to be part of these conversations. And I've been advocating from that, as Sarah knows. Um, we don't always agree um, since the beginning. But if ag wants to participate, they need to up their game and they need to consult with scientists. I have a Ford van. I go to my mechanic to fix my Ford. I don't go to my doctor to fix my Ford. Um, and so if, um, if Ag truly wants to be part of this conversation, then you need to sit down with fish biologists, you need to sit down with ecologists, and you need to, need to get your facts straight. Thank you. You have a comment or? Okay. Yeah, just r real quickly, in the interest of time, uh, I don't know who's going to tap out first, the chai or me at this point, but um, <laughs> I, 
I, I want to hear that. And some of the comments you may continue peppering here. I understand it's a lot of information, especially the CDFW. Um, uh, but And I do agree that even the available uh, evidence presented, some of it today, is more anecdotal in nature than uh, rigorous scientific analysis. That said, it, it, it's still useful. It's still informative. It still gives us something to talk about. Uh, I am more concerned about some of the misstatements that have been made regarding uh, some selective reading of the groundwater sustainability plan, uh, that it absolutely proves there's no connectivity uh, in these streams. So I picked out some selective reading, and I just want to let people know. Uh, the issue is not settled by the GSP, one way or the other, all right? It has not been proven that there's no connection at all. It has not been proven that this complex hydrology does exist. In the Big Valley Basin, there's two primary streams, Kelsey Creek and Adobe Creek. The potential exists for these streams to be interconnected to groundwater. During the wet winter months, streams are predominantly sourced from rain, and in the drier summer months, the streams, there is little to no flow. During wet conditions, the creeks may gain water from groundwater or lose water from groundwater. During dry conditions, we're in three years of drought plus, the creeks are losing water to groundwater. However, confirmation of the impacts of surface water as well as the characterization of this hydraulic connectivity would require additional intermediate surface water gauges and monitoring with new shallow monitoring wells to better understand the nature and the timing of the hydraulic connectivity in the creeks. Further, as Marina pointed out, there have been identified habitats along these creeks. Um, the hitch migrates each spring from the lake into the tributaries to spawn. These habitats are potential groundwater dependent ecosystems if and when the surface water bodies are inter interconnected and dependent on groundwater. Further monitoring is needed to establish groundwater dependence through frequent monitoring of groundwater from future shallow wells located close to these existing surface water monitoring stations. And the GSP, to the extent it does provide more evidence, it says, hey, we have a lot of shallow wells. And in driving around the district, I see a lot of shallow wells right next to the creek or right across the road from the creek. This is not accidental, but neither is it proof positive that there's a suppressive effect. So when we hear what the agencies are asking for, I hope you hear this loud and clear. And I know you're up here saying, oh, we absolutely have to frost uh, protect pump. Didn't do it when we had smudge pots. Don't do it in the Central Valley when we have wind machines, even if it is the best available technology. And I will take everyone's word for that right now. Doesn't mean it's the best solution we have after three years of drought. So the voluntary actions that are being proposed here today by our friends and the agencies include begging, give us some data. So even if you aren't committed to stopping your uh, groundwater pumping during frost protection, open up and say, you know what, we'll take some measurements while we're doing it. Help us fill in the data gaps. So uh, I know we're going to continue to hear more about this and all that, but one, we don't have any action item on today's agenda that says anything about groundwater pumping. We certainly have a lot of information from our partner agencies about their concerns about it. And so I want to share that despite your understanding of some of the potential impacts of this, uh, I hope you'll open your hearts and minds to the available evidence and say we haven't settled this one way or the other. Probably not the make or break um, that people think it is, but uh, I, I just think if we continue the comments, let's not necessarily argue about this or that scientific point. We're all going to have questions when we leave here tonight, um, but let's take a look at what some of the solutions might be, and it sounds like the low-hanging fruit on that is a commitment to be open-minded and share some data. Hello, how are you, my friends? My name is Red Pine. I'm from the village of Koi. The village of Koi and his lands owned me. So I'm here with no data. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm here to tell you some stories that really make a difference culturally. So the Koi Nation did a, um, a Native American Graves Protection uh, act. So, so we had to do some studies to find our, 
our um, cultural items. One of the places we went was to Milwaukee Public Museum. The gentleman who was the first curator for, for that particular museum was a guy by the name of Samuel Barrett. He lived in Calpella. He was the first anthropological student to graduate from UC Berkeley. And before he went to school every fall, he took a long walk and he meandered through these areas from Calpella, Calpella, Ukiah, and so forth, and he made a lot of friends, collected a lot of things. I went there expecting to find arrowheads and baskets, which were there. The unusual thing, which I did not expect, was a large bag of hitch fish. I went, what the heck? This guy studied every aspect of what we did. So fast forward, shortly thereafter that, and his consultants went from several hundred in the Pomo community to about 98 when he was done with his studies in the area. And the majority of that was in the southeastern portion of the lake. And he studied that particular portion because of its resources. The hitch fish, the magnesite, the ability to use tule for many other objects, mats, homes, the whole thing. So our family moved away because we were chased away from the area by pioneers at that time. We moved to Sonoma County. Still coming back up here in May for the hitch run, still coming back up here for roundhouse ceremonies. And my mom used to tell me when, in 1950, when she was a little girl, they'd go walk in the creek. Walk in the creek. Reach down, you can feel them around your legs and throw them out. That's how they ate. It was a chew substance. Fast forward to when I'm uh, about seven years old, five and seven years old, we still came up to visit relatives up at LM. My dad liked to go fishing. We'd borrow our relative John Kelsey's rowboat. We'd go out there, and he laughed at us. He was sitting on the shore watching us pull away, chuckling with our fishing poles. My little fishing pole did not have Mickey Mouse at the time. I can tell you that. But anyway, so we came back with no fish, and he laughed even harder because all we had to do was go to the creek. Fast forward another 20 years. As a young man, I'm working clearing some logging down in Sonoma County, worked with the Native Americans there, and they're telling me how hard it was to get hitch, a substance of our people. So my great-grandparents, my great-great-grandparents are from uh, Elem and from Koi, and my mom's dad was from Big Valley. So I've got a lot of relatives, and I heard a lot of stories over the years. So fast forward to this time when I'm 27, and there, nobody's eating fish. So the promise... Of, of this fish coming back for a Native American substance is looking highly unlikely without us doing something. And um, so right now, I, I would encourage you to be open to everything. The Koi Nation is willing to help whatever, whichever way we can. We have a lot of connections within the Department of Interior, with the state. We'd be willing to go ahead and make some connections if we needed to help you do what you need to do. But there is no fish, fish. Native Americans are not eating hitch fish because there are none. So I just want to let you know that. Thank you. Thank you. How are we doing? My name is Joe Weber. I'm a Big Valley Tribal member and Housing Committee Chairman. I live on the Rancheria on the shores of Clear Lake. My family is the Hopper Clan. I am a cultural practitioner. My relationship with the hitch is symbiotic. For 18 years, I've been harvesting fish. Studies show that within five to, or three to five years, the hitch will be gone. We need to understand that Clear Lake Hitch is, is the only place in the world that the hitch live is in Clear Lake. When the hitch, uh, uh, the hitch is a big event when they run because it's seasonal which means we catch them for substance consumption. We dry the hitch so our elders and us can make it last throughout the next season. The hitch is not just a source of subsidence, it's a part of our culture. My Aunt Genevieve Hopper and my Uncle Nelson Hopper talked about how the families go out and harvest the hitch. They'd share their knowledge with the hitch with us, how the families work together to fillet, salt, and dry them so that we can store them and eat them later for the years. I have fond memories of my brothers and sisters uh, and my kids going out and catching the fish, bringing them back to my moms and aunties. 
Soon I'll be the age to where I won't be able to go get the hitch. It'll be up to my kids. Hopefully my grandkids will have this opportunity. We won't be able to be carrying on these traditions without, without your help. This is why I come before you to ask for your support, to make sure Clear Lake Native's source of substance and culture will carry on. The support can be as easy as monitoring wells, uh, regulating watersheds, do the five-year drought. When it comes to uh, racial quality resources, uh, resolutions to natives, hopefully we can be at the table. Working together with the grape growers and vineyards so we can divert water when needed, which would be when the hitch run. We've passed our knowledge of the hitch from family to family. We are the original stewards of the land. Help us make sure our children have a future with a hitch. It's not just a fish you'll be saving. It's a tradition, a healthy way of life for the clear-lived natives. Don't let the hitch go extinct on your watch. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Tama e Waxi Ran Montez Buchike Habenapoi. Hello, my name is Ron Montez. I'm an elder from the Habenapo tribe. Um, I was raised on Elem. I was born in 1949 in Calusa and moved to Lake County with my mom, who was a single mom. She raised me. And we lived on Elem. She married a, a man from what they call then Sugar Bowl, which is Scotts Valley now. And we have um, been a people that has a history in Lake County. Um, you wouldn't look, believe it now, but there was one time my cousin was, Marvin Brown was the, the homecoming king for the Lower Lake Trojans. Man, all, the, all our relatives were so happy. And, and so after him, he, two gener uh, two, he was like two years older than me. And so after him, I became the tribe, the homecoming king. And everybody thought, woo. And then after that, his younger brother, Thomas Brown, became the homecoming king of Lower Lake Trojans. And after him, our cousin Rich Stewart became the homecoming king of Lower Lake Trojans. So we have uh, participated in our sports, in our communities, in our ceremonies, in our roundhouses, and in our um, pride that we have in how our ancestors lived before us and how they managed to keep food. Although it was a different time, there was more abundance of food, but there was a responsibility that they had for their culture, for their families, and for the fish, the water, the trees, the animals, the berries, and the grasses that we survived on. And so we're here today, again, bringing up, um, and looks like there's gunslingers in here. They're all positioning, and we're looking for which way is the sun pointing, so it's in somebody else's eyes. But I want you to remember, the Native American people in the United States of America has always been, and still is, thought of as a savage, that we don't have what it takes to become civilized. And it's proven because they took away everything that we had. And it was open season on Native American people in the United States and in this 
the state of California, that for our heads, for our beheading, and even for the scalp that was taken, they paid $5 when a day's wages was a quarter. And then they paid $100 for each head that was brought in. Our government sponsored that and paid. And so that is part of our history, which is not taught or preached in our school systems. But I know it, and many of my fellow tribal people here know it. And so when we talk about hitch, some people say, oh, that's just a fish. It doesn't have that much weight to it because you can eat other fish. But there was a time not too long ago when people, native people would come from Sonoma, Mendocino, Sacramento area up north would come down and camp around these creeks we're talking about. And in that place, they would meet other tribal people. They would, sh they would trade and they would look for new husbands and wives and, and they would uh, share their stories around this fish that we're talking about. And then that fish was in so abundant supply that every one of those tribal people who came, they took home enough to supply their food for until the next season. And in that act of gathering this fish, there was such a community, a sharing of values, where the young kids would go in and grab them and, and hand them over to the older ones. And the community afterwards, you know, all those fish had to be cleaned. And our older women, our dakaras, would sit around and they would scale them all up, cut them open, cut all the guts out and salt them. And as kids would grab them and would go and uh, we'd take them and hang them on the, on the lines or wherever on the, on the tree limbs until they dried and we gathered and put them in a big sack. And that's what we lived on. There was a long time here in Lake County where Indians could not get a job. We had to go out and do some of the worst jobs around. William Benson, who was a tremendous uh, man, that a pomo man that made baskets, had to sell them just to make a living. We had to travel from here to other counties for work. So they won't hire us here. And so we had to make do with what we have. And that fish, our chai, our sha in our language, that sustained us. And it was not the best smell on fish around. But it was a jerky, it was a food source that I still crave today because I have that in my DNA. I have witnessed that. I'll shut down here in just a minute. And I want you to know that today, I would encourage every one of the groups in here, lay down your arms. Get back to what's real here. We're talking about people. We're talking about a culture. We're talking about my ancestors who lived here thousands of years before there was the United States, before there was the California, before there was a Lake County, and before there were any crops out here on these hills. Those are the weightier manners, matters that we need to keep our focus and attention on because those are the things that will help us learn and work together, solve difficult problems, and show, show these other counties that we can do it here in Lake County.
We can. So lay down your arms. Let's do this thing. Let's support one another. Everyone commit to do what you can to help. And I, I, I commit to do that too. So if my three minutes is up, thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Alicia Costianos. I work for Big Valley Rancheria. Um, I'm also a tribal member at Big Valley Rancheria. Um, I am 21 years old and I have never experienced hitch, um, fishing for hitch. I have never eaten a hitch. Um, it's not because I don't want to, it's because there's not enough. I hope that changes can be made for future generations so they won't have to miss out like I did. Thank you guys for having this open discussion for us. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm definitely not going to speak to the history because others have represented very, very well our tribe's perspective on the importance of this natural, cultural, and traditional resource. Um, I do want to say that it should be important to you as our leaders here in the community to take some action. Um, I know we're not supposed to speak about the next section, which I'll speak on that as well, but Tribes have not only been here since time in memoriam. We have, in modern day, been one of the biggest contributors to jobs, to adding resources to the community, to putting the lights in Upper Lake High School, to contributing the North Shore Fire Protection District for wildfire mitigation, to being your partners in, you know, you name it, protections of sacred sites. We need your help because the hitch, our cultural resources are no longer within our land. Unfortunately, we've lost a lot of our land and some of us are still landless, but it really does fall down on you folks to take some action. Federal agencies, state agencies, even county agencies are all rallying around this effort. We really need, and I'm asking you to please take some positive action to help here. Um, it sounds like the state is already going to be looking into regulating. So, you know, I, I'm, I am as sensitive to the next, you know, business owner. We understand that people need to make a livelihood. And in fact, you know, if it's, food, we all rely upon that. So we have got to collaborate and find some solutions. Um, this looks like a solution. And it's only asking for the county to call on others to do work. So I'll save the rest of my comments, but it, the county's responsibility in, in this is very minimal. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hekate my Ukate Council, we can Robert Gary, Yahake, Limbuck, Yahake, Habematalo, Tavel Kit. How are all you today? My name is Robert Gary. Um, I'm from Alem. I work for Habematal. Um, I'm the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. Um, Hitch falls under um, a tribal cultural resource. Something under were two main resources that sustained um, our communities acorns and the Hitch. And so these are two um, really important um, parts of our life, important, important parts in created events, ceremonies surrounding these things. So um, just wanted to, um, and from and like we're talking about the proclamation, um, understanding and taking a look at that, um, you know, it's important because it looks like it is, you know, from uh, Chairwoman Trepa, um, this is a solution. This is um, something that can, can start to be done with it. Um, and I'm not sure as far as for you know, the ag community, but you know, when we're talking about the issue with, issue with um, you know, the frost um, spraying and, and those kind of things, I mean, the proclamation, it doesn't address any of that. 
um, it's just basically taking action to be able to, to, to um, protect um, this resource. And so, you know, I want that to be known and, and understand that, you know, um, according to, you know, what's there, it's a plan. Um, and in, I, I haven't heard anyone sit here and say what a specific reason why the hitch is in the situation it is. I think there's um, a lot of components of what we're trying to say or that we're trying to find out what it is. And that's why all of us, tribal communities, the public, um, state and federal um, agencies, um, it's important to make sure that we find all of the data, work together to be able to do um, what we need to do for the survival of this, of this resource. It's something that is indicative um, and that is only known to here, Lake County, to Clear Lake. And so it's something that we have to do together to make sure that we have that ability for just like this little girl, um, young girl, sorry about that, um, to be able to do something that her ancestors have done that she's never had that ability to do. I've watched that that, that trend um, change in my lifetime. As a boy, I used to fish for these fish in Schindler Creek and in Siegler Creek down at the south part of the lake. My older children, I taught them, we've actually went out and fished for these fish. My younger children have never gotten the opportunity, just like her, because of the numbers that they're in. So there has to be a plan. The proclamation is there, and it creates us to have a plan to be able to help us sustain this resource, this tribal resource, this cultural resource. So I'm asking you know, to make sure that we take that into consideration when it is brought up at our next, um, you know, next phase, I guess, of this meeting. But I thank you for taking the time to, to listen to all of the concerns, especially from the tribal communities, um, the ag communities, but we can only do this um, as a united front and collaborate together um, in the collection of all of this data to make really good plan and decision for the survival of the hitch. Thank you. Thank you. No. Okay. Anyone else in the chambers? We'll go to the Zoom room now. Haji Wharf. Okay, you can state your name and you've got three minutes. Haji? She's coming on. Okay. I'm muting myself. Hold okay, on. Okay, great. We can hear you. Good afternoon. Oh, that was my original word, afternoon. But good evening, board members. My name is Haji Wharf from Upper Lake. I want to express my full support for the emergency proclamation. I consider myself a stakeholder as my husband and I have 20 acres of ag zone land in Upper Lake near the confluence of Alley and Clover Creek, tributaries of Middle Creek. 10 of our acres are currently under production of hay and grain in previous years, grown without supplemental irrigation as we only have a domestic well. As a property owner, I feel until we monitor wells, including mine, and groundwater usage, we are poking around in the dark Wells are straws that draw down aquifers and surface water flows. Wells are the silent desiccators. Before moving to Lake County, we lived for four years in the high deserts outside of Tucson, where water is the most critical and regulated resource. Subsidence from over pumping of groundwater was the biggest issue. So that's where we're headed. If we don't get a handle on this, not only will we not have surface water, sufficient surface water for all interests, but the land's going to sink, okay? So to have the usual suspects of the anti-proclamation ag interests imply their water use doesn't affect stream flows is preposterous and magical thinking. And do not pass the stinky lake smell test. Their perspective does not match up with my experience. The hitch have been endemic to Lake County before the presence of man. Their precipitous decline coincides with the renaissance of the wine grape industry in our county. There is no denying that fact. 
As Lake County is perceived as having cheap land, available in large tracts, and industry friendly, our diverse hillsides and valleys will continue to be transformed into thousands of rows of monoculture grapes, which means dramatic increases in water consumption by the industry. It's best to put in mitigation efforts now to curb the appetite for water as conditions will become untenable and disastrous for all stakeholders. I want to see limits on wine grape irrigation that uses groundwater or surface water until June or when the hitch run and spawning concludes. I also want to see an injunction and removal of surface water diversions along the major arteries. I accept there are competing economic interests at play here, but the loss of the hitch would not only be a shameful legacy for Lake County, but also a loss of a cultural inheritance for our tribe. Another tragic consequence in a long line of historical injustices. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jim Steele. Okay. Jim Steele. Yeah. Uh, okay, you've got three minutes. Yes. Your name, please. Sorry. Okay, thanks. No, I just have a quick uh, point to make. Uh, when I worked for Fish and Game, I was on uh, three separate teams uh, reviewing listing petitions uh, to advise Fish and Game Commission. And there was one thing that uh, came up in uh, all of those considerations is whether or not any local effective programs and protections were already in place and whether additional uh, protection authority was needed. So that level of valuation was made at that time. And that basically colored whether or not they needed to list at the state or federal level. And so the protections that are in place were part of that test review and it's based on life history data of the fish. And I just hope that uh, all of you consider that when, um, when you take action, because if you decide not to recommend listing of this fish or take any negative actions that nothing else is needed, then that's going to show up later. And in 2014, the fish was listed and really very little has been done since then. And that record is now on the table. So I just want to point that out and uh, hopefully that guides you going forward. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Fred Brionis, maybe. Fred, Fred. Okay, you've got three minutes. Hello? Please state your name for the record. Hi, yes. My name is Fred Briones. I'm a tribal member at the Big Valley Rancheria Band of Pomo Indians. And I wanted to make a comment specifically on them. Um, in the room, there's many people who've only been in Lake County since the 70s. We've been here for over 10,000 years. And underneath that dam is an old Indian village. And see, they did those things to us like that, to cover us up, systemic racism, to promote farming activities, to, for everyone's knowledge, you know, farming never existed in Lake County until Kelsey came. And then that's when agriculture started to take over. And then now as we see, this water being used for wine production, causing the death and disappearance of our hitch, our fish, it's sad that our members the old and the young, we are completely, we've missed, we've, we've lost our hitch and we've lost so much, our land, our resources. And I wanna make one fact that during those times that we've lost, they've always used alcohol to swindle us out of our resources. And here again, we are losing our lake. We can't even ride on around on our boat anymore because they pumped it so low to make wine wine has only existed here since the 70s when it was food it was fine but now this wine and water they tout that it's a billion dollar industry and we have lost so much so a lawsuit potentially that we will open up if we lose our fish and nothing is done about this that's right around the next corner so we really need to take some actions and what the actions that I propose to end agriculture in Lake County and let's have a sanctuary for the animals because that's how really it was when those people moved here to Lake County in the 70s, they moved there because it was so beautiful. There were so many animals, there were so many 
birds, so many trees, so many waters. All the settlers did. They moved there. But then they have, look how they do to our resources now. And I warn all of you, supervisors, everyone in the room, if you do not take action against agriculture, the of the wine grape grower is that our lake is the private liquor barrel reserve. And there's nothing for the animals. How shameful. Let's make Lake County a private animal preserve where there's animals, plants, baskets. We could go right around in our boat. Let's make a, a minimum level in our lake where the water must go up to the people's docks for crying out loud. It's ridiculous that our water resources is being turned into wine and it's causing so much death. So unfortunate. And that is my comment. Thank you. There are no further hands in Zoom. Okay. Um, I'm going to bring it back to the board for comments. Supervisor Spatier. So I guess I'll start it off. Um, Love to see some action. Um, I, I don't think, um, I, I, I hope that we can bring the entire room together. Um, my opinion, there's been, I, I, I've seen this fight happen between uh, different groups and I think we all have the same issue. Mm -hmm. And that's the issue of what the climate is doing to us. Uh, farmers are enduring this issue. Uh, our lake is enduring this issue and our nature is enduring this issue. Um, and I, I would love to see some changes occur. I know that we have a drought task force. Uh, it's been brought to us to discuss wells. I want to discuss wells. I know that I've brought it up before. It was a ve very touchy subject, uh, but seeing a uh, setback from our creeks for where we can permit wells, whether it's 50 feet, 100 feet, 200 feet, whatever it needs to be, I think a mile is a little bit of a stretch in my opinion, but something realistic as to ensure that the cone of influence from the well does not touch or have contact. So I, I, I want to see further discussions. Um, I, I, I want to I better understand the subject, but at the same time, there's topics that I think we, we have to talk about. The time possibly is very limited. Um, has there been a conversation about a potential hatchery just to make sure that in the short time we have, we can ensure to save while we figure out how to do the long-term fix of what nature needs? Um, what can be done? Um, I want to make sure that we're all together on this and not pointing fingers at who's at fault. There's obviously conflicting data being provided. Um, anecdotal evidence is, in my opinion, not a very useful way of providing data. Um, I respect the data that was provided by water resources. We've paid a lot of money for that data and have gone through some pretty intense scrutiny to get that data together. Does that mean there's still gaps in the data? Absolutely. Uh, I don't think science is ever settled. Uh, you keep gathering more data until you realize, oh, well, we found something new that explains why it is that we're dealing with. Uh, but there's a reason why we're seeing more fires. We're, there's a reason why we're seeing longer droughts and more often seeing droughts. Um, let's focus on that as being the issue and recognizing that the hitch are being impacted by that. Uh, obviously, I don't think I need to explain that. It would be rude of me to do so, but it's been very well explained, the cultural significance. But what is the ecological significance of the hitch in our lake as well? So I would love to see some action. I think that the length that we've been here today just for this one single item, and there's some other very important items to get to, I'd love to see this come back, digest the information, and figure out what our action is because, and I'll speak to it, sorry if I'm breaking the rules, what's in the proclamation has no enforcement 
capacity whatsoever. We already have rules we have to follow on if we're going to develop things because of the hitch being on the state list. So between, I want to say, April and October, we need to make sure to do specific CEQA processes to ensure that we don't disturb, and I could be wrong on the dates, um, but I know it ends October 15th, to ensure we don't disturb the spawning of the fish. Um, if the other part of it is to prohibit taking and taking is not occurring, then I want to make sure we are taking action locally and not waiting for the state to either take over or the federal to take over, which again will take years before anything can occur. Um, I'll stop at that. Uh, there, there, there's, there's other little issues um, throughout the whole thing, um, but I'll stop at that. Supervisor Green? Just point of order. Are we discussing the discussion item that just finished or are we diving right into the proclamation discussion? Because um, we, we can do it either way, but I thought we were still in comment uh, for the, uh, uh, the, uh, the discussion he, only item. That's what we were. He did break the rules. Well, a couple people did it. So I, I, just uh, for the sanity of everyone involved, uh, I, there's a lot to unpack just from today. Uh, there may be some bullet points in the emergency proclamation people want to study. There may be other actions that people may want to propose. So in the interest of time uh, and energy and sanity, uh, uh, I'm, I'm totally willing to bump the second item to February 7th, I'm told, as a correct date. Uh, that would uh, allow us time to, you know, what's the goal of an emergency proclamation? Well, if you take out all the nine bullets in this one, it, it looks like any other emergency proclamation we've passed in the past several years. But um, there may be some further input that people want to give regarding proposed actions. So uh, if we are bringing up the proclamation item, it would be uh, with the consent of uh, uh, you know, with the consensus of my fellow board members would be to uh, uh, postpone this to February 7th, allow people to digest a lot of what's um, uh, occurred here today. And, and I think, honestly, that would be hugely useful. When I went to the summit, <laughs> when I went to the summit, <laughs> uh, Mr. Dummy here, Mr. New Supervisor, stood up at the end and said, you know what we need is a Clear Lake Hitch Task Force. And I was literally at a meeting of the Clear Lake Ch Hitch Task Force, which I didn't know existed. And then there's a Clear Lake Hitch Strategy, which has been kicked around for four years. I didn't know about that. So there is a lot to unpack in terms of the state of the, the chai and what our next steps are going to be. But as we saw, there are a lot of jurisdictional issues here, a lot of partner agencies. So the sp specifying the asks and in what manner they get made can be made through an emergency proclamation. That's pretty simple, but could also uh, involve other asks, like you said, a different task force. Or maybe we do need a county-specific clearly hitched task force. No offense to the task force. Our, our uh, partners have already spun up. So uh, I, I just want to offer that. If people want to plow through this, I know they're here. I want to be respectful of their time. If they really want to go blow by blow on the emergency proclamation, I'm here uh, as long as we need to be. But I, I did want to offer the uh, uh, option of bumping it to February 7th so we can all get some rest, all chew on some of these ideas, and then come back uh, and take a fresh whack at that. I would like to hear from the other board members. Well, I'll go ahead. Um, I think that we still have to open up the item to let people talk about it, um, if they want to move forward with it or not. Um, so I can make my comments after that happens. That way I don't delay the process even more. So, I mean, we can still decide to push it forward, right, or, or stay on it. I'm just, because of the requirements, we still have to do, take the item up. So if somebody wants to come up and speak on that, that's, uh, that would be the next item. So I just... If your board decides to continue sub B, then the public will get to comment on the action to consider a continuance. Um, and you could also take up commentary from people who could not be present on the 7th. So you do have some flexibility, but people are allowed to comment. Right. Uh, if we're going to do that, would it be appropriate to introduce the item then and just kind of run down it briefly? 
I just want to make sure there wasn't any other comments on all the presentations. I mean, well, I'll just do that real quick. Okay. Okay. So, um, sorry. I just wanted to uh, make sure we stayed online because I know that uh, we commonly, even if we have it on the agenda, we still have to move forward. So, um, <clears throat> I, I addressed one of the issues that I had when it comes to illicit grows. Um, I'm on uh, another committee that I just got appointed to called the Farm, Ranch, and Rural Community Advisory Committee. It's an EPA um, advisory committee. Um, there was one last week, and I met with Martha Guzman, uh, the EPA Region 9 Administrator, and told her all about the situation that we're talking about right now, along with others that I won't get into. But the biggest thing I told her, along with the state representatives that are online and whatnot, um, and I won't go into depth of their, of their names and whatnot, but I told, I, I keep touting out and telling them, look, I understand we have, we have these issues we have to deal with, but for me, there's, to me, it's a three-prong also approach with the, the Middle Creek restoration because it provides a habitat, um, helping us expedite that because it's been 30 years, helping us expedite uh, the tributaries because there's so much vegetation, especially in my district, uh, in the area, um, and prescribed burning or anything of that nature. But some of these permits that we are stuck with at times to, you know, to uh, preserve the hitch are kind of hindering the hitch as well. So if there's a way that these agencies, and this is what I've told them before, if there's a way that we can figure something out together so that there is also um, oversight from the tribes when there is um, eradication of the, you know, the sediment, because that's one of the things too, is even if it's sediment from the hills, tribes need to be there to uh, observe just in case there's something that flows down. Working collaborati collaboratively in that manner would help as well. Um, so I've been saying those things because it's frustrating for me that uh, we're all we're all in conflict over some of this stuff, and uh, in in some instances, uh, these groups want to you know put these orders out, but don't want to give us the resources. They want us to take these actions, and I understand this action is important to also apply for funding in the future as well. And so that's that's some of the things I wanted to talk about. I know that. Um, a lot of other things have been said, so I don't want to get too far into it. I know one thing that'll help is the Blue Ribbon Committee. I know we've been meeting and, and discussing projects that'll help in that manner as well. Um, so, and, and another thing I'll add is I did I did attend at what was called the Ag Venture, and I learned a lot about Ag. I never knew anything about Ag, but it was really helpful for me to understand the points of view. Um, and so. You know, regardless, um, this situation is uh, dire when it comes to the hitch. I have ate hitch before as a kid. I, I, uh, I went and uh, collected them in Middle Creek. I was told I was trespassing, but okay. Um, but I've done it before and I got in trouble for it, so I had to pass it out to elders and, uh, and all of that. But it is, it, it is, um, it is important to the, uh, the tribal communities and uh, to me as well uh, growing up. So. I'll just leave it at that. I know we're going to talk about the next thing. If uh, we'll go from there, Supervisor yeah. Simon. I just had a, uh, and I, I think Scott or someone is still on. So I know there was a conversation talked about today about the um, Highland Spring Dam and the Adobe Creek. You know the opportunity there for some flows. I'm not saying it's a fix, and I know we went right to the 34. Uh, acre feet or whatever uh, sorry I forgot the wrong term it is late uh, but anyway not looking at that to be a solution but just a cog in the wheel of how we're trying to have solutions so maybe some extra flow or anything there I know Scott you said it wouldn't support it wholeheartedly but uh, during years that there weren't a drought or anything that we'd have if there were some slow flows I'd still like us to look at that down the road to have that conversation as an and as an option not just as you know a saver drought and just go there so just keeping that on the list of looking at it as a crutch if it's needed there uh, in some aspect or you know so I just I know you said no but I'm like well yeah I can't do it on its own but if it's just a supplement of something, uh, you know, uh, I would really like us to, to look at that and see if that would be an option, at least to continue that conversation. And Supervisor Simon, uh, I, I was stating some facts. Um, the system was never designed for that, but that does not preclude um, trying it. Uh, I don't think 
anyone in my department is uh, opposed to trying, myself included. Uh, and certainly this would be the year that um, we would be able to do that. I, I'm hoping we get a few more storms and, and uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the um, Highland Springs and Adobe Creek fill up uh, full uh, to their entirety. And, and uh, this would certainly be the year to do it. But uh, it, no, there isn't anything that's off the table. Uh, I, I just, it's um, my, my point was the system was never designed for that and, and it would drain that system very, very quickly uh, if that was something we were trying to rely on. But we can certainly give it a try and and see what impact it would have. Yeah, and I think just as a tool, you know, uh, we're looking to build long-term sustainability, having those options. Obviously, going through some of the recommendations here and, and, and some of the folks of, you know, prioritizing those barriers that we've heard multiple times today in each presentation. How do we get those barriers out of the way and really focus on those? And that's not going to just come from the county here, obviously. We're going to need that support of uh, Fish and Game, Fish and Wildlife, you know, all these other organizations. And just to continue on, I know we may be hearing a little bit or moving this on potentially, but I think the one thing that I just look at our recent history here, we have the tree mortality. We did the proclamation because we want to bring that focus to it. What was disappointing to hear is that we, over the past few years, have put in, and I can't remember how many years, but $10 million worth of grants, and um, you know we weren't successful. Whether that's in coordination with tribal nations, other agencies doing the work, I think the proclamation is going to open that up, say, listen, there is an emergency here. I know there's a lot of agencies working on that, um, but I just want to continue the conversations. I myself uh, was lucky as a young man with my uncle Ed to go actually to Abemato, Upper Lake, the old res over there. We used to go every year when I was a young guy and collect the hitch, and it was just as you said, you almost felt like you could walk across the creek because there were so many hitch in there, you know, as you pull them out. So I was lucky enough to experience what was talked about with Ron, Ron Montez and, and, you know, whether or not we get back there, but the existence of the hitch is, as he said, in our blood, in our people. And I think it's something when we talk about putting Lake County on the map, uh, cultural tourism, the long history here in combination with the partnerships that we have with our organizations, I think is <laughs> extremely important and obviously near and dear to my heart. I don't know how we get it, but I clearly understand the ag community. I, I just want to um, say that we went through this a little bit with the cannabis. It's not perfect, uh, but I think we need to look at it from all aspects. And I think if we come together and I didn't hear anybody from either side saying, don't care about the hitch. This is not something that I heard in this conversation. So from my point of view, I know there's there's equal ground that we can land on here to support both industries, uh, both from the tribal and our community needs, but also from the ag industry, because that's part of what Lake County is too. So um, I think we can get there. If we're gonna push it off, fine, but eventually action needs to be taken. Thank you for bringing this. I know it's a long day. Uh, we'll call you the rookie. Good job, rookie move. Uh, but we, uh, but this is important. This is hugely important. So, understanding that, that's what I have to say right now with those, with the reports that have come out. Oh, sorry. Step back. Up. Okay, who's first? Do they have his pen up? Is your pen up? No. Okay, you're first. I just want to offer that if, if it does get moved, if that's the approval of the board, I would offer that we do a special meeting because this has already lasted uh, quite a long time. Obviously, a lot of people are in tune and are uh, wanting to hear and participate and care about what the consequences and actions will be. Um, and the seventh, I'm seeing list after list of items that are being moved to the seventh from our agenda today. And so I just want to make sure that we have ample time to listen to everybody, to talk it out, and not feel rushed to, to, to get to a, a point where we're making a decision without finishing our conversation. And I think the public deserves to be able to speak freely and what they want us to hear. And we need to have the time to deliberate and, and go over uh, everything. Supervisor Green. I see Susan looking at the calendar going, how many special meetings are we going to do? Uh, I, I, uh, uh, I appreciate the comments. I, my hope was at the end is that the, uh, the, the proclamation would be 
uh, routine, if you would. Uh, I think a lot of the uh, comments that are made here tonight have been made. Uh, clearly, we have concerns um, from multiple stakeholder groups. Um, I, I am prepared to proceed. I don't think it's that controversial what's in there. Uh, I can explain a little bit. So if we're going to present it anyway and open it up for public comment, even for the purpose of continuing it, maybe I could. Uh, maybe we could do that. Maybe we could open the item, I can present it, and then um, we can either decide to proceed uh, uh, to do it or we'll continue it. Um, but it's not, I, I would like the opportunity to at least present it and open it, if only because we have to, to uh, accept public comment on any possible continuance. Does that sound right? Oh, well, I, I just want to recognize that we're all part of this system and and we've all come here um, to 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 work, to push this important work forward. And if you want to go ahead and present it, we have to present it anyway. I'm fine with that. Um, we originally had 10 items um, beyond this tonight, and they are rapidly disappearing, uh, but we still have a significant amount of work to do um, beyond this item. I do think that we all need a little bit of a break, though. Um, if we can get back here in 10 minutes and um, stretch our legs and get a snack and uh, come back here, and I'll let you present, and then we'll make a decision beyond that. So if I could get everybody to find their seats again. We're having another staff change. Okay. Okay, so we have Johanna back. Okay, so we are still on item 6.10. We will be moving on to um, section B, consideration of draft proclamation, declaring a Clear Lake Hitch emergency. Supervisor Green, you want to present? Um. Yeah, I hope everyone has had a chance to review it. Uh, in one sense, it's a pretty routine thing when a county does an emergency proclamation. We did one as recently as uh, Friday at our special meeting for uh, some of the flooding we had from the last atmospheric river event. Uh, this one's a little more extensive than the average bear uh, because it does have several asks uh, of our uh, various state and federal agencies. Um, uh, and so going through those bullet points and then I also be one respectful for people who are just tuning into this issue uh, I don't want them to get hung up necessarily on uh, a this bullet point or that bullet point uh, In this draft proclamation. I also agree there may be additional input from our partner agencies and some of our colleagues here tonight as far as they might want to see in it so I I very much appreciate everyone's patience as we got through the first part of this item. Uh, uh, the emergency summit was so foundational to this, and, and this has been our first little uh, approach to emulate that in our own kind of limited government way. Um, so while I do think there is a need for an emergency proclamation, uh, this is one of the slower moving emergencies, uh, and this is going to be an ongoing effort. And um, I'm encouraged, as much as I'm discouraged by some of the things I've heard in this room tonight, I'm, uh, encouragement is, is uh, the much greater emotion I'm feeling now. Just as the summit brought people together uh, so they could exchange ideas in a very candid, in-person way, uh, this item tonight has managed to do that. So I hope there are some first introductions that got made here today, and I hope some of those uh, uh, actions can continue. Uh, but I think because we do have some other agenda items and because I don't think um, uh, uh, this proclamation going up or down tonight is going to be the make or break of this, um, I'm seeking board consensus to continue this to the February 7th meeting. And uh, 
uh, and then we would open up for public comment on that proposal, I guess. So I, I don't really know how that would unfold, but I think um, just be respectful and just to take another bite at the apple when we're all fresher, um, I think it may be advantageous to uh, move this to the seventh. Okay, other board members, how are you feeling about continuing this to February 7th? I've already mentioned it, so you know where I stand on that. You know, my thoughts on it, if we're going to move to February 7th, that we look at that agenda that gives it the time that it needs. Um, you know, obviously, I think that's very important. So go ahead, Susan. Yes, um, we can reserve 130 on the 7th. And it's a fairly um, regular meeting. It's, so we should have enough, sufficient time. And we'll keep that in mind. Supervisor Crandall? Yeah, so I mean, even if, uh, you know, I'm prepared to move forward today, but if we were, it doesn't seem, you need four to one for this to pass. So um, I, think, I think I'm on board, because it'd be awkward to, you know, call for the resolution and we get a 3-2 or something like that or vice versa. Um, so uh, rather push it forward than to go through that awkward moment, you know, if that makes sense. So. Okay, so we do have consensus to move it, continue it to February 7th. Uh, I'll, I will open it up for public input. If you have a comment on this item, what on the continuance so just um, if, if you can't be here on the seven this is a time where you can you know come up and say something or um, if you want to talk about the continuance I think as well that's a good opportunity to do so okay good evening uh, my name is Elliot Hurwitz and I uh, live in Siegler Springs on Cobb Mountain I'm the chair of the Cobb Area Council Forest Stewardship Committee and the former chair of the council, which we established after the Valley Fire so that we could come together after a catastrophic disaster. I'm currently on the executive committee of the Sierra Club uh, Lake Group. And for the last year, I've been active in the Blue Ribbon Committee, uh, working especially on restoration of some of the principal creeks, Kelsey, uh, Cole, Alder. Um, I'm uh, executive director of the Siegler Springs Community Redevelopment Association, where we work to build community solidarity and collaboration in the face of challenges, especially those caused by climate disruptions such as intense wildfire, fire, drought, and chaotic ecosystems, and where we publish this uh, comprehensive guide to living with wildfire in Lake County. I'm also a grateful uh, uh, alumni of the alumnus of the Ag Ventures program and a happy member of the uh, uh, California Women for Agriculture, although I'm not uh, speaking in any of those roles this, this evening, only as a member of the community. Uh, having read through all of the extensive material, sat through the uh, uh, program uh, all afternoon today, I think there's no doubt that the Clear Lake Hitch is teetering on the brink of extinction and that the principal reason is the reduced water flows in the main creeks during spawning season. It's also clear that this reduced flow has many causes. I just want to make sure that we, we, we are on the topic uh, that has been narrowed down, that it's about the continuance and not about... I, I'm speaking to the, to the proclamation, because I th thought that that was... A, I'm basically going to ask for your... Uh, right now, there's a consensus from the board to continue, and that well, narrows well, down the item to speaking about the continuance of the item. So whether you agree or not on the continuance, not on the item itself, I believe, is what's... Unless you're amazing. not able to... Unless you're not able to be... I may not be able to attend on the 7th, which is okay. why I was basically making my comments this evening. Okay. Uh, I don't know yet. Please, I apologize for interrupting. Hmm. My narrative flow there, thanks. <laughs> uh, uh, so as I said, I've, having you know, spent the time preparing, as, ever, as everyone has, going through all the material and you know, sitting through the extensive presentation tonight, it seems clear that there is the, uh, the, the hitch is in, you know, uh, in, in danger of extinction. And um, you know, it's clear that, that whatever the cause, that the, the, the issues have to do with the uh, um, changes that we as human beings have made to this environment over the last 150 years. 
It's also clear, clear that this small fish holds a, a unique and precious place in the culture of the Lake, Como, Lake uh, County Pomo tribes, and its loss would be yet another catastrophic blow to a culture that has, is an essential treasure to us, all of us here who've come to live around the lake, uh, especially as we struggle to build a more respectful and sustainable relationship with the land that sustain us, sustains us. In all of my work here, I've come to realize that the immense value of the living spirit of connectivity with the land, the air, the waters, the many creatures that our local tribes have kept alive, has, have kept alive against unimaginable odds. I'm not saying that the tribes are the only ones who love the land. I know that the farmers and many people who've lived here for generations also do. But I suggest that our Pomo brothers and sisters have kept alive for us here a living lineage stretching back thousands of years that embodies a unique and irreplaceable web of connection to this place that's our home. There's no doubt that changing how we manage our relationship with the natural so waters. Elia, I, I gave you a little bit extra time because of the interruption, but can you just finish your thought, please? I had this timed exactly at three minutes. Okay, okay. Proceed. Go ahead, finish. There's no doubt that changing how we manage our relationship with the natural waters in our local ecosystem will be difficult, and that the burden of change will fall unequally if we're not careful. However, just as we are learning to live with wildfire, here in Lake County, I believe that we can learn to live intimately with the waters here, especially as their flows become ever more chaotic. And we need to understand how our respect for fire, the waters, the soils, and all the creatures with whom we share this place are essential parts of this web of life we share. I urge you to pass the resolution and then to work intensively with all of us who use our lo local waters to drink, to bathe in, to cook with, to grow food in and spawn in to make sure that we can survive together. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am so sorry. <laughs> Anyone else in the chambers wanting to come up? Hello, Dino Beltran, Vice Chairman for the Koi Nation. I won't be able to be here on the 7th. Um, so at this time, you know, we were, looking, we were spoken earlier by our elder Ron, you know, Native Americans are mar marginalized for, for all this time. You know, we're just now starting to get a voice because like Sherry said, you know, we're bringing jobs, we're bringing the collaborations, partnerships, all these wonderful things. Now we have this voice. So at this time, um, because of the, the sensitivity to it and, um, and your openness to it, uh, I would appreciate it if you would pass that resolution when it comes up on the 7th. Um, I think it, it, it's a good thing. Oh, well, I forgot to mention another thing. The, the Coin Nation has purchased some property a year and a half ago, 70 acres. The majority of it are grapes. Now we're in the business selling grapes to wineries, and we have to make a decision <coughs> right now, and we're looking into changing the water misters into the um, the, the big giant propeller things. I'm no wine guy yet. But um, Anyway, so that is a decision that we have to do to be our steward of the land and, and care, care about the water and the consumption of water. So it's looking highly likely we're going to do that. Um, but just to let you know, that is in the consideration of water where we're at. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Rob Morgan. I'm a tribal member and the executive assistant with the Koi Nation. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to say, you know, I wanted to come up and um, kind of give my, I, I don't know, I, I should be here on the 7th, but I just, this is a little bit to, that has to do with Aaron and you guys making the decision today. Um, I think that this is a decision that is urgent. This is something that we put put on the back burner when it comes to the extinction extinction of these species. Um, this landscape and um, the species that have lived here is different. So much has changed in the last 150 years compared to the, the last 10,000 years. We were steward, stewards of this land. <clears throat> we were here when um, when, even when we were being killed 
by the grizzly bear, we still lived with them. We didn't try to exterminate them. We lived with them. One of the last traditional ceremonies that were put on, um, burials that were put on on one of the southeastern islands um, was due to a bear attack, a grizzly attack. And um, I, I just recently, I don't, I don't know if you guys seen it, but on the clock of doomsday, doomsday it's moved forward in the last, I, I believe, decision was made um, in the last 24 hours. You know, this is, it, th these are scientists that are talking about this. We are, we are exterminating ourselves. And part of the reason it has to do with is because we're not making decisions right. We can learn from our history. I, I learned a lot of stuff from the archeologists from around the lake. And one of the things that they say is the reason why we have the cultural protection that we have now is to learn from our past, to learn from our, our ancestors, the people that were the original stewards of this land. And I do believe that th it's urgent. It's urgent that we do what we can. As a Native American, I'm, it's my responsibility to be a steward of this land. So everything that I can do, I do. But that's no longer on us no more as Native people. It's on all of us. Everybody that's here now that lives on this land, you, you are now the caretakers as well. It's not just us anymore. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I just want to make a comment regarding carrying this over to February 7th. I too may not be here to be able to make comments and I can appreciate both the sponsors position on wanting to do that if you don't feel you have the votes, which it's becoming apparent that you probably don't. Um, it, it is disappointing to say the least that a proclamation and thank you for again for proposing it um, where Items one through eight, and there are nine, items one through eight call on others to take action. And the county is only taking action on one item, and it's pretty nominal. Um, so to say this is should be routine, you're absolutely right. It should be routine because it's not enough. And even Supervisor Sabatier said that it's not enforceable. And in fact, that's, that's, that's very true. It, it, it doesn't go far enough. Um, but it is disappointing that if this can't get passed by just calling on other agencies, then I, I worry about getting any meaningful action on this issue that is, uh, you know, it's, it's dire. Um, so I hope that if it comes up on February 7th that you all do support it. Um, and we will try to send someone to that meeting. Thank you. Anyone else in the chambers? What about in Zoom? Jim Steele. Okay. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just want to point out that um, the, the proclamation, of course, obviously needs to be passed, and I agree with. Supervisor Green, I thank you for bringing it forward, but you really need to do more than that to show a local record of controls and interest and uh, monitoring. So it, it should go further than just your proclamation, and I hope that you will uh, continue it so that you can hear more data and perhaps uh, some more recommendations of what could follow the proclamation in the future. You don't have to stop with the proclamation, but you can actually review some actions uh, that you can take uh, that will protect the hitch going forward that you haven't taken in the past. You already have a listing on the table of being threatened, so you can act on that basis right now. So uh, just just a thought, uh, there are some things that came up with the threatened listing. You can bring back and re-review to see if you can take something away from that. So thank you for the comment, period. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Haji Wharf. Haji, go ahead. You have three minutes. Thank you. I don't need three minutes. I just want to say I object to the delay to push it back to February 7th. I don't understand the controversy. 
Um, I understand you're tired, uh, but I think pushing it back sends the wrong message. I think that shows that you don't have that sense of urgency and the hitch don't have the luxury of time. Okay. And I don't know what the holdup is. It's pretty benign. If you can't pass this benign a proclamation, then you might as well just write off the hitch now. Be brave and say, you know what, we care about the wine industry more than we do the hitch. And just be brave enough to admit it. All right? I'm really upset that you're not going to take this up tonight. They need your help. I don't know why you're sitting up there if you're not going to do what the community needs you to do which is to protect our endemic species. We will be the county with an extinction event of an endemic species first in 50 years. That's not the legacy I want for Lake County and you should neither. You should feel a sense of urgency in preventing that. And I'm very disappointed you're gonna push this off to February 7th. I don't understand it. That's all. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Anybody else? Fred Briones. Uh, yes, hello. Hi. I would like to comment and also say that I'm very disappointed that a vote is not being taken up tonight, especially there's two POMO representatives there on that board there. Uh, to protect our hitch, you know, it should be no question about it. But there is, see here, we try to play the song of Kumbaya, but in reality, it's not. It's agriculture. Agriculture has always uh, taken away from tribes. Agriculture is so foreign to Lake County. And now it pins our whole community, our water supply for the animals, for the fish, for the hitch, for all everything against the wine industry. This wine never had this much before in the past. I really wish Beckenstoffer was here in this meeting so he, we could tell him how much death our fish has disappeared because of his vineyard. It was never like that before. So to not take a vote, really, you're just kicking the can further down the road. And, you know, you have to ask, you know, with the history of Lake County and systemic racism, are, are you a, a descendant of Kelsey, Stone, Reeves, Lyons, Davis? They've always done this to us, just kicked it down the can. Forget about the Indians, promote agriculture, my cattle, my wine. How shameful now that our lake now is a liquor barrel reserve. That's the fate of it. So shameful that the natural beauty has been sold. But the tribes, no, we will never ever give in to those types of things. We have always been the stewards to this land. And to not take a vote tonight, it really shows the true leadership there. I'm so sorry to talk to you like that, but you need to be more uh, affirmative and concrete on what you're trying to protect, the natural beauty. Tell those ones who've grown vineyards since only the 70s since they've been here, get the hell out of Lake County, please. You're killing all the animals. The elders before me used to say all this, that the vineyards would do this to the deer. It would do this to the fish. They'd kill all the, the land. They said it, but no, there was so much money involved, gold versus flesh. That's always Lake County's been like that. So please take a vote tonight and show true leadership, strong leadership for the Pomo people who've been here for 10,000 years versus the ones who've only been here since the 70s. Please go to Lake, go get out of Lake County, go to Sonoma, go to Napa. We're here. You're taking all our water to turn it into wine. So shameful. That's my final comment. Okay, thank you. Lori Montserrat. Hi, Lori Montserrat, State of California Environmental Protection Agency. Um, I'm not going to be here on the uh, next date, but I do urge the board to take action on this and to protect the image. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that's it. No more hands on Zoom. Okay. So bring it back to the board. Um, we have consensus to continue. Oh, you have, oh, you have another comment, Supervisor Green? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll totally take a motion to continue, but I, I, I want to be very clear moving forward that respect is a two-way street. Uh, I'm indebted to the First Peoples for bringing the attention to this board of the first fish and the efforts we're going to make to try to save it. Uh, but I'm going to object to characterization of uh, members of our agricultural community as being anything other than stewards of the land. Is there room for improvement in some of their practices? Does the ongoing drought challenge our current understanding of best available technology? Are we talking about all agriculture or just those along some of our stream corridors that most affect the lake? The most important thing that has happened here tonight is to get these people in the same room, just as it was important at the emergency summit to get the agencies together and start communicating about what they're doing and what they're not doing. And here in this realm, leadership requires, at the end of the day, we have to take some votes here. And an emergency proclamation is an unusual creature. It's not a simple majority. If there is a state of emergency, we need at least four supervisors up here to agree to that before we can pass it. Now, I know it's disappointing that we continued this hearing today, two weeks from January 10th, because we weren't ready to rock and roll just yet. I can tell you that the draft emergency proclamation was not born out of thin air. Uh, most of the asks in there have been vetted directly with the agencies that they're pointed at. It is also important to know what is not in the emergency proclamation. As you have heard continuously from all the agencies, there's going to be a series of meetings. There's going to be a series of voluntary asks for action. And that the emergency proclamation is not the place to do that. And it is fair to say that it looks outward towards some of these other agencies. And one reason it does that is because they are catching up themselves as far as what their roles and responsibilities are. And because the county is a little bit late in coming to this. Um, but we're here now, and we're committing to taking uh, our own sense of leadership within those things that are in our jurisdiction. Uh, and when we do bring this back on the 7th, we can go down those specific bullet points and those agency asks. One of them was to ask the Blue Ribbon Commission to take a look at prioritizing its projects uh, for those uh, that are most hitch beneficial in the short term. Uh, and they're meeting tomorrow, so it is unfortunate that we can't give them that direction. But I think most of the agencies you've heard here today already have a pretty good plan of action of what they need to do. What we don't have here locally is consensus and willingness uh, to be open to other views, to be open to other voices. And um, that's why it's appropriate to continue this emergency proclamation now. This is certainly an urgent matter, um, but it is uh, unlike a wildfire where it just burns through in a day and we're just left there cleaning it up. This has been years in the making. It will be years in the solutions. Uh, and the emergency proclamation will be just one little baby step along the way of that. So I do think it's hugely important, and I do appreciate people for commenting and, and demanding action tonight. Um, uh, but I think it is more important that we debate the actual uh, impact of this proclamation when we all are fresh, when some of the voices who couldn't be here tonight may be able to join us, uh, and just take a deep breath and decompress all this. The one thing that is not in the emergency proclamation is any order for anyone to open their hearts and minds uh, to listen to what has been said here tonight. But that's really my request uh, before we get out of here. Um, so uh, uh, I, it, there does seem to be court board consensus to continue this to the 7th. I don't know if that requires a motion or what. No motion? Do we need a date and time certain? I have reserved 1.30 for this item. 1.30? Mm -hmm. um, so those are my comments if anyone else wants to comment on the continuance, but uh, it, we appear to have consensus to do that. So 1.30 p.m. February 7th. Supervisor Crandall? Yeah, so I, I just, <clears throat> I, I wasn't going to say anything, but I have to because no matter what, um, Mr. Briones will be upset with me anyhow. So 
I just have to say, the gentleman that came up and said, we live with the bears even though they killed us, right? Remember that statement? Um, that is how our ancestors were. They took in people as long as they had the same respect for us that we had. It's, it's unrealistic to think that anybody's going to go away or leave or force anybody away. And so I know that as a Native American, as a POMO, I, I don't think that type of behavior and discussion is conducive. This is the reason why we can never sit in the same room. And so I don't, I don't align with what was said. Um, and I don't know if my fellow, you know, my fellow Native people feel the same way, but for me, I, I think respect goes both ways. And regardless of, you know, profit or whatever happened, you know, things of that nature, it's if we want to work together and get things to get done together, we can't speak that way. So um, I just have to say that um, I was willing to move forward either way. And so when, you know, it was said that, you know, as a Native American, I'm not willing to, it's just a little disheartening to hear that from, from people. So I just have to say that. Sorry, but... That's how I feel. Anybody else? Okay. Well, I appreciate all of you coming. Um, this has been a long day, and we've, we've listened, and I think we've learned, and I think that we've done a lot of big work today. We have a lot of big work ahead of us. I'm looking forward to that, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all in a couple of weeks and continuing this. So... I'm, I'm sure you're, most of you aren't hanging around for the next eight items that we have. Um, so drive safe on your way home. And um, I just urge you all to think about what's happened today and what, you know, everything that's we've talked about and discussed. And we'll see you, so, we'll see you soon. <laughs>